gather around freaks it's thursday night you know what that means it's time to gather around the entire internet uh i'm sorry the internet's gathering around the entire hated to see this one here on twitch live and i have one question and one statement to say to you before we get going here and it's if you must blink do it now In a world where creativity is buried and dead, a mysterious movie studio lies in waiting, tinkering away with the tools used for captivating audiences, with heartwarming stories crafted through the exquisite art of stop-frame animation. It's time to take your first steps, or perhaps revisit them, on a whimsical journey where the magic of this unique technique unfolds, immersing you in a world of wonder and enchantment and shadow. But amidst the captivating visuals, when the world seems dark and life feels like a heavy raincoat, Hey, Did You See This One? reminds you to slow down and take things frame by frame. my goodness it's another episode of hey did you see this one uh hello welcome this is the show it's thursday it's episode 125 it's episode 125 that's so many episodes so many episodes steve's been here now for 111 of them the guest that whoa one 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 oh (laughs) i think that's quick maths yeah that's quick math um we are here it is uh it is uh frame by frame did you like uh, this one um a sort of dive into like a studios uh this month we talked about paranorman we talked about missing link we talked about the third one that i'm blanking on right now steve help Coraline. 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 I almost called it Caroline, like Caroline. all the plebes in the movie. Yeah. And <laughs> she'll haunt you now. <laughs> and this week we're talking about Kubo and the Two Strings. Uh what an incredible what an incredible movie. And um we are joined this week by a brand new guest. One hundred percent brand new off the presses, ladies and gentlemen. A fresh guest has arrived. <laughs> um this is uh Tatiana uh Ramos. I did it. I botched it. I think. Ramos. I think you did it right. Titanium you got it right. There's Ramekin. just a pause. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Honestly, that's a sweet name. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. I believe that you've been booked. You're one of those guests that we have had booked for like a year also. Yeah. Steven would reach out quite often and then it would never quite like pass that finish line. No, it's but. perfect. <laughs> I think you're here for for a great movie. Um, I, I, I texted you like right after I finished watching it to let you know that I was crying. And we had never met in person before, so <laughs> I think we finally got Jason to cry. Yeah, it, took, it uh, only took 124 episodes. <laughs> I don't think I've actually. I got a little misty uh, at parts of Coraline, I think, but it wasn't so memorable. So this week, uh, this this is a special episode. Um, I think it's going to get a little heavy. Uh, so you know. Get ready yeah, well, for let's that. Let's all cry <laughs> uh, live on Twitch. On this comedy tonight. podcast. This is, of course, a review, reaction, comedy, analyzation podcast uh, that we do each and every week. Um, to start things off, though, each week I put up, on Monday and Tuesday, I put up a part of the movie poster, um, and I have people guess on the internet. And would you would you know it? People do it. People come along and they say, hey, I think I... I know what that is. Basically answering the question, hey, did you see this one as a yes? And this week, uh, much like the previous weeks, we had a lot of people to the point that I had to like stop, like not do it on. I still did it on Tuesday, but I didn't push it as hard. Um, I think sometimes I put up a part of the poster that is like too obvious because I'm afraid that people aren't going to get it from like this little piece of the moon back here. So it's the white screen. Yeah. <laughs> Have you seen this? Hey, a single bird. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there there are significant birds in every one of these Leica movies. So like maybe that is the way to go. But this is the fan guessing game. This is the fan guessing game. Congratulations. You have successfully guessed the correct answer. Which is the answer you provided. Congratulations. Congratulations! Everybody heard that, right? I'm so paranoid now. <laughs> that I heard working. it. working. Um, this week, uh, oh, cool. A uh, SEO scammer just messaged me on Facebook. So I'm going to give them all our money so we can get more views. I'm not going to do that. So this week, we had mostly podcasters who have their own podcasts come out of the woodwork. Mostly new people. Uh, movies by TV. So this is funny. So it used to just be movies by Doug. He's a person I'm in a, a podcasting group with on Facebook to sort of promote our show. It used to just be movies by Doug, but now it's movies and TV by Doug. So Doug has uh, evolved in the last couple of weeks. What was that sound? There was a sound. Um, he <laughs> wanted to say, uh, he just wanted me to say, uh, just for people to enjoy movies, enjoy the way movies make you feel. Which is mm. apt for this one, because I felt a lot of feelings that my cold dead heart hadn't felt in quite some time. <laughs> He's done it, folks. He's finally felt genuine human emotion yeah. from a motion picture. <laughs> my heart grew exactly one size, not three mm. or five, like the old Grinch. <clears throat> um, additionally, we have Jonathan Phoenix. Uh, he wanted us to let everybody know that he has a podcast, um, but he didn't give us the name. He gave us a link that I'll link in the description. But uh, I'll do that for you, Jonathan. Um, also, the uh, Back of the Cereal Box podcast got it right this week, which I think is a great name for a podcast. Uh, they do uh, 80s and 90s cartoons and movies, I believe. So check them out. They said Masterpiece. Masterpiece. Not I agree. Right. I agree. Um, uh, Melissa Lieber of the uh, <clears throat> Ouch, Was That a Ghost podcast? Just when I told them that they got it right, that said, lol, yay. <laughs> <laughs> An honest reaction. Exactly. <laughs> Sounds like something a ghost might say. <laughs> uh, they, do a, they do a ghost, a spooky ghost, uh, ghost stories podcast. And uh, friend of the show, former guest of the show, uh, fan of the show, fan of this game, never gets it right, but always has a great... Uh, Oh, God, I know who it is. <laughs> Always has a great, I guess, guess. I wouldn't say parody because I don't know what this is a parody of even. Uh, Matt Philp, put your kids to bed for this one and cover yours if you're a fan of heart. He guessed. This is a doozy. Falcon Penis 4. This time it's anime. <laughs> 
animated. I've seen that one. Yeah. <laughs> he was so close. But... There. <laughs> you have successfully guessed the correct answer. It's playing on its own also. I Which think this oh podcast God. is haunted. The answer How you that go? Is... <laughs> Congratulations. What did I hit that played that on its own? I think it's you summoned it by provoking the name of ouch <laughs> it's a ghost or whatever it's oh my god yeah so this time it's an anime it's ghost penis 4 um that was the correct movie guesses uh additionally as i have to do because you know we're, we're trying to get people to listen to this if you are listening right now um if you're watching or listening whether you're in the chat on twitch uh if you're from the future and you're listening to this down the road uh please go ahead and um follow us you can find us on most social media uh, at Hey Did You See This One. We're on Instagram pretty prominently, Facebook, uh, Twitch every week at 8 o'clock Eastern. Um, I just want to let everybody know that we actually hit a major milestone this week. Okay. 1,000 followers on Yay. Twitch. 1,000. And yes. what were you going to say? I said, that's the reason it took me so long to join. I told Steven, you got to hit a thousand to get me. <laughs> We're not coming on. Yeah. That's what I figured, <laughs> honestly. And also I wanted, I did the math. We're at 1,009 right now, actually. And I did the math. It was real hard math to do. It took me all of 10 seconds to figure out who the 1,000th uh, follower is. And they are a user by the name of Matthew Lovinger Gaming. And I messaged him and I said, in all caps, you're our 1,000th uh, follower. And he said, I'm glad I could help. <laughs> so. So yeah. enthusiastic. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, he could have said lol gay. <laughs> <laughs> I wish that he had because that would be a little bit more, a little less anticlimactic. Um, and also, as always, shout out to White Bat Audio. The music that you heard in the pre-show, um, of course, that goes away pretty quick. But we do use White Bat Audio each and every week for that pre-show segment. There is a, that music we were listening to in the pre-show is new. And it's like it's called like Hypno Wave or something, like Dark, dark Wave. And I listened to it while I was preparing and then played it again while we were having the countdown. And man, it's good. It's a good one. So White Bat Audio, shout out. And I guess with that, we're going to move on to some uh, some director talk. How about that? How about oh. a little director all talk? All right, all right. Quiet on set. Are we rolling? Okay, let's shoot this piece of <laughs> Sound. Speed. Action! This is, of course, the segment of the week where we talk about the director. It's pretty straightforward stuff. Um, we have a new director for this one right this is all i mean travis knight who is the ceo of leica studios so he he has been involved in all of these movies but he's not directed one front to end alone this is the first one so is he the and, one uh, that did the sort of hostile takeover of leica in the first place no he created like like he didn't hostily <laughs> take it over uh, he created it uh but he yeah he i mean he he headhunted a lot of the talent that existed in the stop frame animation world. And he, he built the studio with daddy Warbucks's money, True. but you know, not all nepotism is bad. He's created a beautiful work of art in Kubo and Coraline and the missing link and Paranorman and box trolls. And do you know what else he directed Steve and Tatiana? Do you know what else? Why don't you tell us? Bumblebee. Bumblebee the movie. The movie yeah. Bumblebee, the prequel to the Transformers. Which actually isn't that bad. I hear it's fine. It's better than most of the Transformers movies. I'll say that much. This movie's rated I think I've only seen one Transformer movie, and it's the one with Rosie Hunt and... I can't... I, mm, the one that's married to Jason Statham. Um, right. I think that's a later Transformer movie. It's not good. No. What was I mean, the gimmick? Was it? Uh, what's the highest praise you can give? Was there a knight in it? Movie? Were there robot dinosaurs? Was there? She looked beautiful. That's all I can say is she looked stunning through like every moment of that movie. <laughs> so Megan Fox was no longer in the movie, so it's got to be no. like the fourth one on. Uh, was Shia LaBeouf yeah. still in them? Yeah. Which did she turn into like a robot person? Was that, that... would be cool, right? Like a little cyborg. Satin... Yeah, I don't. I remember bits. I wish and pieces. I had more information for you. No, uh, nothing. Yep. Bumblebee and Kubo are his. That's it. His two movies. Yeah. Interesting. 
But I think the reason that he doesn't like direct that much is because he's also the CEO of the company, right? He's probably got a lot of other stuff to do. Um, but this movie also felt like weirdly personal and like very heartfelt. Yeah. So, I mean, he he's clearly good at it. Like if he made this movie, he should make more. Uh, I know there is another like a movie coming out next year. And I'm not sure if he's directing or if he's just producing or writing or, you know. But, uh, I mean, we've talked about Travis Knight in every episode of the the uh, show this month so far. So we don't need to go too far into it. But I do think it's it's worth noting that this is, you know, the, the first one of his projects that he's had so much involvement in that he, he directed. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I think some people might consider this the best Leica movie. Um, I, I don't know if I've fallen that category yet i don't know i watched it today and i was like this movie rules this movie really rules and i was crying and I sobbing, my I heart was sobbing. here's a first Swelling. for the show i'm gonna reveal this to you now and it's gonna blow your freaking mind but i watched this actually you know what <laughs> this isn't the time uh we're gonna go on to our um to our brief history and then i'll hmm. blow your mind how about that okay uh, so do you have anything else to add about travis knight the director of this film we pretty much covered i mean we've gone through it all if you guys want to hear more you can listen to our previous episodes in the Leica series yeah all nine hours of them <laughs> <laughs> um that's right so now we're going to talk about our brief histories for the movie kubo and the two strings a brief history uh it is of course a tradition around here um a time-honored tradition to give our guests the first opportunity to give their brief history. So Tatiana, uh, tell us about your history with this film. And also if you have any little, you know, any little facts to pepper in on that as well, if you got anything, but basically, you know, when's the first time you saw this movie and uh, how did it make you feel? So um, in all fairness, I had not seen a single like a movie um, at all. And then when Steven was giving me the option of which one to choose and he described Kubo, I was like, I do love any stories based in kind of that mythology um, style realm. So it was my first time watching Kubo. Uh, I double featured it with my first time watching Coraline. And I haven't done Missing Link and Paranorman yet, but I will because I was blown away by both. So um, yeah, I was sobbing by the end. I actually did not believe that it was stop motion. I was like, there's no way they've got to have like a mixture of both. But no, I watched a lot of behind the scenes videos to be like, you need to prove it to me. Like you need to show me the steps. Um, but yeah, absolutely incredible. And I literally, after watching the movie, I messaged Steven and I just said, thank you. Thank you for <laughs> like getting me to watch this. It was amazing. Um, yeah, my wife has walked in while I was watching at least three of these. And every time she goes, this is stop motion. I know. And I'm like, yes. And then a record scratch happens in the background. Like, <laughs> Watching like what? how they make the puppets and everything too was just astonishing. I was just like, wow, the amount of effort and work that needs to go into every single scene, every yeah. frame is I think, unbelievable. I think that uh, this movie in particular and The Missing Link, those two movies have very extensive and interesting uh, and worthwhile behind the scenes footage stuff that you can watch of how they animated a bunch of the stuff because it, it, you know, it's evolving as they grow as a studio that every project they do becomes more and more impressive. And the harder it is for you to believe that it is stop frame, but then you, you know, you watch just like a sped up version of a person animating monkey doing a roll or something. And you're like, holy shit, that yeah, took probably four days for that one roll. Finding out that the skeleton was actually like... Eight feet, eight feet tall. tall. Yeah. It was sixteen feet, feet tall. 16, wasn't it? 16, feet tall. Yeah. I think it's. I think I was reading that it was like the still like one of the largest puppets. Mm -hmm. I think in existence, like built or animatronics or whatever it's considered. Um, yeah, I was just blown away. Yeah. Blown away. I, and I actually like. I will watch it again. I think this is going to be one of the things that I put myself through annually. <laughs> <laughs> it is kind of yeah. It's emotionally draining, but it's also very fun. Mm -hmm. Also, Thank if you. you've only watched it once, watching it a second time, your your mind is open to a whole new idea of what the movie and the story is, and you're already privy to you know what the reveals are later on. So there's even more emotional impact from specific moments yeah. that you're you're not aware of yet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Steve, mm -hmm. give us your brief history. 
I saw this movie in theaters. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, I I love stop frame animation. No, I but I'm like I was jealous a boy. of you. It was quite an experience. <laughs> the sound design in this movie is excellent, and seeing it in a theater with you know ear busting uh, speakers was worth it. Uh, even just the opening alone, I was already like, oh my God, this movie's going to rule. <laughs> when he's like, if you have to blink, do it now. I'm like, oh my God. That's like saying if you have to pee, you should have done it already. <laughs> you look um, at your large size drink at the theater and you're like, I've made a mistake. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like blinking wildly at it. Just like, um, yeah, but the, the, I saw it in theaters the first time and I loved it, but then I kind of time went by and I didn't watch it or even think about it again for a very long time uh, because it's one of those movies that it didn't get put on streaming for years after it was released. And uh, at this point I was like trying to get rid of all physical media in my life. I was really trying to like micro live, like only have the essentials so I could pack a, a backpack and leave at any moment kind of thing. Um, so I didn't buy it on Blu-ray or anything. And then one day it came on uh I think it was Netflix. Um, and I just sat down and I watched it with on a date night. And it was very nice. It was a great date night to, you know, have somebody who I'm not fully comfortable with weeping next to me while I'm also weeping. <laughs> that, that was an interesting date. Um, and then I didn't watch it again until yesterday. So I've only seen it three times. I should probably watch it more times. It's wonderful. Are you ready to have your mind freaked? My mind's going to get freaked. I thought I was going to get blown. I was preparing for a, bl a blown mind. <laughs> freaked and blown. Uh, not only, this isn't new. I watched this in one city. I couldn't put it down kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Tatiana, I have this thing where sometimes I'll watch movies in as many as three parts because I, my attention span is so messed up from TikTok and video games and everything that uh, I can't do it. I try and I try and then you get this one happening. Mm-hmm. Right. So <clears throat> this one, I was like Tuesday night, I'm watching it. I'm going to watch it. And I was immediately from the beginning of the film when he starts um, telling the story, I started to like well up because I like like Japanese folklore stuff so much and the music right in the in the, the instrument. What's that instrument called? I forgot to I was going to I'm going to look it up. And... Shamison, I think. Right. Am I right? I, it I'm is. Yeah, it's a shamisen. Shamisen. Okay. So that instrument I love. I love that that plucking sound and the 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 the, the tonka drums. I love all that stuff. It sounds so good to my ears and my brain. It scratches some edge. I think it's because I was like raised on like anime and uh, like JRPGs and stuff, right? Like that's that's my shit. Like Final Fantasy. This I'll get into it a bit, but this was like this could be like a final fantasy story a little bit steve hates it when i do that also no, i don't hate it it's, you know, it's, it's predictable it's predictable it is. Yeah. well there's more to it than that at any rate um i watched it again today i watched it a second time this wow. is the first time ever this is the first time ever oh thank you thank you so much thank you. first time ever i watched the movie twice our old co-host who left the show uh, he would watch the movie sometimes three or four times before, and um, I couldn't do it. A lot of the times, I'm just like, I'm good. I saw it. It's in my head. But this time, I was like, I cannot wait to put that on while I do work tomorrow and just absorb it all over again. Um, it's visually like beautiful. Like Every scene is so stunning. So yeah, it's, it's nice to have the music really nice in the background, exactly. too. Exactly. Exactly. The soundtrack for this movie is worth just having on as well. I, I use it in D&D &D a lot. I've used it in a few of my recordings for D&D. &D. <clears throat> There's like a specific character that is just the Kubo soundtrack every time they show up. It's like that that sort of like trilling music that happens every time a new scene breaks. Uh, that's their, their character intro. And that's like the sign of a great soundtrack for me if I could connect it to one specific character. Um, and that, that Regina, like none of these movies have had like a title track like a like a, a you know an actual musician doing a song but this has regina <laughs> specter doing yep. a cover of george harrison's while my guitar gently weeps but it's got the shamisen over it but it's it's got like the the japanese flair and it's a really like it shouldn't have been my shamisen gently <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't know if the words fit. Also, the lyrics don't make any sense for the movie either. Uh, but that's okay. It. Uh, oh man. I'm already getting a little. Uh, oh, Jason's gonna cry. <laughs> Uh, at any rate, I guess that's our brief history. Um, oh, do you know what? We do director talk after a brief history, so we're already moving on to the body of the episode. Are you ready to uh, see this body walk down the catwalk, friends? I, I don't know. Ho, 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 ho! Everybody back up, because here comes the body of the episode. You know, that that sting feels gendered, but, you know, it could be literally anybody. I mean, in my mind, it's a handsome man. <laughs> in my mind, it's a handsome woman. <laughs> I see, like, you know, like the hippo in Madagascar. Right, yeah. <laughs> like, I see a body. <laughs> yeah, like a real voluptuous body. Yeah. Yeah. The hippos from Fantasia. Yeah, yeah, or, yeah. yeah. Similar, <laughs> similar, yeah. Yeah. No, I just see like a film reel like slithering down a runway like a snake. And That's it's making really cool. it's making different body shapes we're of doing, all shapes and sizes. We're doing excellent work here tonight. I um, think this is a whole new segment now. It's just recordings of Steven and then we all close our eyes and describe what we see. <laughs> a lightning round of all the stings and we yeah, and like you said, what do just, you picture? Yeah. <laughs> which you have to make another sting for, which is like, what do you picture? <laughs> it's just a never-ending loop. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. So um, I didn't write a lot of notes for this because it's this movie is kind of an action movie at its heart. Um, so there's it's also got of- horror elements. It's an adventure film. It's it's all sorts of stuff, man, wrapped into one. It's but great. I, it's- I, normally, like, a movie, for whatever dumb reason, I'll take some hour and a half movie and write, just take four pages of notes. <laughs> But I think that this one is a little different where there's these giant swaths of just like animation, right? Mm-hmm. Where I'll kind of just mention what happens scene for scene, but we, we don't have, I didn't have to write a lot because I knew there was going to be no problem talking. Mm-hmm. I don't know how this is going to play out. Normally, Tatiana, if you've never seen the show, I basically go like beat by beat through the movie. And sometimes it gets very long winded, but this hour and 40 minute movie isn't going to be long-winded because of my notes it's because there's so much to talk about and it all starts with a fantastic intro of a um a person on a boat with a baby going over these amazing waves uh we hear kubo say kubo's like narrating so basically says if you must blink do it now the thing that i said at the beginning when i totally botched our intro bit um i don't know what i was doing i had a red bull at work at like four o'clock and I've been like weird. <laughs> been like weird. And I think that's just Red Bull. I think that yeah, just does it. Because I don't drink energy drinks very often. But uh I wrote immediately I cannot believe this water is stop motion. Um you know she's cruising through on the little on the little boat. They're clearly running from something. They're she, running from the moon man well, we the don't, moon is chasing. We don't them. know we that don't yet. We don't know that yet. Well, I do. I saw the movie before. <laughs> Your review of this movie is from the third also, time you saw it, and our review is from the first time. We yeah. don't know there's a baby there yet. Like she's on the boat. I'm like, damn, this girl is on an improper boat for these waters. <laughs> <laughs> but then she cuts a, w- a wave in half with a, a guitar with a string. sweet chord. Yeah. It um, is really cool. This entire sequence, when you do know that her father is literally the moon and that he is chasing her essentially um the moon is in every shot even if it's like you know the wave coming up you can see the moon through the waves the fact that he's using waves to attack her it's like you know in our reality the moon controls tides and would be able to control the wave so it's like in the magic of this universe he would definitely be able to control water right in some capacity Um, also like one thing that I noticed on this watch that I hadn't noticed before is the moon is always full every time you see it until the very end when he defeats his grandfather and it's just this thin sliced crescent moon at that point. It's almost like the entirety of him has been removed except for this like small little chunk, which I was like, wow, I can't believe I didn't notice that before. That's such a good storytelling element told only through visuals. If you're paying attention because, uh, uh, 
in Coraline, the like uh, the button moving over the moon to do the eclipse, that was mm-hmm. a similar sort of thing that you had a similar reaction to, where you were like, I didn't even really. I didn't really. Get yeah, in that it was more like that was like it was like a timer almost, yeah. right? And then when it, you it's revealed it's a button, you're like, oh, crazy, that's cool. Whereas in this, it's like the moon is a character, and if you, you kind of moon. every yeah every time you see it, it has a different personality throughout the movie. And this is why I, I like advocate for people to watch all of these movies multiple times because you do pick up on little things because they're spending a month on like a five minute sequence. They're going to put crazy stuff in there that you're not going to notice the first time you watch it, right? Everything is intentional. Yeah, yeah. of course. And we've we've talked about that on the, on this as well and this this movie is the has a similar thing where like everything's so intentional because they have to spend that time on it. But this one is ironically the most formulaic of the four that we covered because it, it kind of feels like a traditional adventure with three MacGuffins. It's like a almost like a Zelda adventure you know where yeah you get the that's thing, what i so felt the first time i watched it too beat yeah. the final boss but you get like a cool like you get a preview of the movie where he's telling the story which i'll get to in a sec and then when you see i was like oh he's just gonna fight these things but then you get three alternate versions of those three things that are much cooler um especially the, the hypnotizing sea monster which is one of my favorite things i've ever seen um but at this point in the movie a wave hits her off the boat. She falls into the water, and we see one of the most violent things I've seen in any of these Leica movies. When her head hits the like rocks, she's—I thought she was dead. I was like, "Oh, she's dead." <laughs> I mean, they, she probably should be dead. I assume her magic saved her in yeah. some capacity, right? Well, she got severe brain damage, which is this whole movie has a sort of deterior deteriorating memory sort of thing going on. I don't know if. Her memory thing has, I thought her memory thing has to do specifically with this, but when they meet up with Hanso, he's just, I don't remember what's going on. I've just been here for this time. Um, We'll get to that, of course. We do have an interesting thing that happens in this movie. And at around literally two minutes um, into this film, we get. That's when they said the name of the movie in the movie. Sort of. Yeah, they don't say the whole... They don't look into the barrel of camera and say Kubo and the two strings, but we hear Kubo's name. But I, I'm setting this up because we're going to hear this uh, We're gonna hear this sting again. Oh, gosh. I have a, I have a, I have a little bit. He's um, going to spam it. I'm, yeah, I'm just going to keep playing it every time they say Kubo. No. Movie, movie, movie. <laughs> I, uh, I made a note that the animation in this is immediately different than the rest of them it's a little bit like paranorman but it's it's got its own visual flair to it it's very um it's very like japanese inspired visually i don't know how to explain this and i've been trying to like explain this in my head that it'll make sense and it and the theme of the movie is very much uh paper and origami centric but it's almost like they were animated out of a book and the the art style of the book is like they're almost made of origami or watercolor and that's brought to life into 3d that's sort of that's sort of how i felt it it, a lot of like i kept thinking of remember the the hungry caterpillar remember that book every time you turn the page it's like the the art style of that reminds me of the Leica style a lot. Yeah. If you I, know I think what I'm talking all, about. Then. Well, I mean, all, yeah, all Leica movies feel very much like those rudimentary drawings that you would see in like a children's bookstore. It's a pop-up like, storybook almost. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but this one in particular feels, yes, inspired by origami. Yes, inspired by, you know, rudimentary uh, illustrations for children's books. But they also feel like those sort of old uh, Japanese illustrations that you would see, like especially when you see his mom for the first time in the cave, just everything that she's wearing, the regalia, the colors, the patterning on everything that they're wearing. Um, It seems like sort of like this marriage of all three of these things, right? Where they're like, where are we going to take the inspiration from? Where obviously we need to have the kid-friendly animation style. So we're going to make things cutesy as we do, but we also have things that are spooky and scary. Um, And then we're going to also take from this... um, I guess you could call it appropriate to this illustration style from another culture. Um, and then um, then they've got their, you know, 
their traditional style that they've been working with since the 90s or whatever right like even the the characters that i have in my background here they they're reminiscent of something that you would see in the nightmare before christmas uh, but they have their own identity that fits fits very clearly into this world as well right yeah they, um they they're great uh they're great mid bosses and they're great characters and <laughs> mid bosses okay yeah sub boss <laughs> sub boss mid boss the the video game elements of this like we were talking about Coraline in that kind of way where it feels like this game should have just been turned into like an adventure game but it was turned into like a shitty like platformer or some it, mm -hmm. bad view this game could make a very good either like traditional jrpg or literally a zelda game because well, you you're literally it's a hero's journey right like you have three items you have to get to defeat the final boss that there's like mid bosses on the way yeah it's cool yeah he's leveling up every time he gets a yeah. new item yeah yeah the MacGuffins, like they they help him out and they help with the team like when monkey gets the sword she's an excellent it sword. is also nice that it like cleanly wraps up by him going back to where he started yeah. to finish oh the my fight. gosh yeah. i actually when it like went to that scene i was like you you've got me like what do you mean <laughs> it was there the whole time it kept showing us the bell yeah. yeah and when you know that that helmet the bell is the helmet the amount of times they show you that helmet in the opening sequence up until he gets captured even the, the scene where he is getting captured it's like in the foreground it is the main thing in your in your face um it's so satisfying <laughs> if you're watching it with somebody who hasn't seen it you're just kind of like <laughs> <laughs> i know something you don't know <laughs> yeah it is totally one of those movies too because like even the even the little reveals throughout the movie are so good that's a very like a thing i've noticed where the whole time the whole movie i'm going but what are the two strings and when that finally happened i was like <laughs> ah <laughs> his parents are the two strings his strings are uh... the two strings on on his yeah. wrist um but that all of that's much later. At this point, we get a little bit bit of a time jump. Um, he's no longer a baby Kubo. He, they now live in like a cave. The mom is in like sort of a catatonic state. He like takes care of her and feeds her. Uh, they when she when they wake up in the morning, there's like paper strewn about. We don't really know what that's about yet. He takes her to like the edge of the cliff every morning. It seems like so she can look at the ocean because she's in this catatonic state. And he heads down into town. And I gotta say, he's the coolest. He he's basically their television and their busker and their entertainment. I I'm wondering, does he go into town every day and just disrupt everything until the sun goes down? It's a long story. And yeah, sorry, finished. it's a full day of storytelling. I assume he gets there around noon. You know, <laughs> like he doesn't three four hours, baby. Yeah. He's got to clean up all that paper that's that his true. mom that's, his mom dream tossed around the room or whatever. <laughs> that scene was unbelievable. Like when he did that, I was like, "This movie has already captured me." Like with the first scenes, but then to do this beautiful story of dancing origami paper, oh, and they would like shred each other. It was it was so cool. If you've um, there's a game for the Switch uh, called Paper Mario and the Origami King, and <laughs> That was the alternate name for this movie. <laughs> Kubo and the Origami King. Can you imagine if Kubo was just Paper Mario? Like, do this whole movie as Paper Mario and the two strings. <laughs> and he pulls his mask yeah. off and he's like, wahoo. Yeah, he's um, like, if you need to blink, do it now. Mario. Like, <laughs> that game, though, uses a very similar like art style for its paper and a very similar thing where, like, when something gets shredded, that, like, confetti goes everywhere. That has like looks really cool in this as well. And I really like when he first walks into the town and there's like a guy with a paper dragon and there's uh, people building lanterns out of paper. And there's all sort of all sorts of like just little details that you don't get on the first go because there's just there's like baskets, people weaving baskets. And this is all, you know, animated with stop motion. Just mm -hmm. they didn't need to do this. This how Steve we didn't talk. Well, about we didn't need to see an old lady put a piece of lint in her bra either. But you know, sure it's, we did. it's uplifting. Yeah, <laughs> positivity. It also tells you a lot about her character. It does. Which it's is, true. Damn, what a badass old lady. <laughs> but she also like she's she seems like the kind of lady who's always looking on the bright side of things, no matter what. Right. Yeah. This this town is not rich. It seems. I thought and a lot of it was a lot of the people. That she was uh, a street person. 
Well, I think that the entire town is like a community. It's very small, right? So, so some people are probably more well off than others, but they're all sort of relying on each other's kindness and charity to be able to survive as like this ecosystem. It doesn't seem like anybody is destitute, though maybe there are some who are richer than others. It also doesn't seem like anybody is starving to death or anybody mm -hmm. is like better than anyone else. It's kind of refreshing in a way to like see this Hamlet almost where it's like, yeah, there are people who are having to perform on the street in order to, to eat, but they don't seem particularly hard pressed by it. They're still and, positive about it. And they're still respected in what they're doing, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And it, clearly everybody in the town loves Kubo because the entire town gathers around to watch him do his, his stuff. And she likes and, to, she likes to request different monsters every week. And she's yeah. like, can you just work in a, a fire breathing chicken, a giant fire? Seems like she often ask, asks for yeah, a chicken. Yeah, like, though, I right? don't know. And, you know. I did a chicken last time. <laughs> yeah. um, um, I do like, before we move past uh, the opening sequence in the cave, we do see him fold a bunch of origami just with his hands, right? So it's it gives us the the knowledge that he's not just like using magic to be able to do this. He also can, he has the skill to fold, fold origami himself without using magic. Um, so to me, that implies that like, he has this innate magic that he gets through the pick and the guitar, but it's also within him. But then he also is skilled. He's skilled, a skilled, yeah. skilled storyteller and he's, he's capable of doing the origami without the magic. Um, I wonder what he would be able to do if he didn't know how to do origami. Would he be able to be as impressive? I don't know. Maybe he just would be able to make paper float around. He feels like I... a traditional bard, sort of. Um, sure, yeah. But with the Japanese flair. Sorry, Tatiana, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, I was just going to say, I had a question actually about that cave scene. Is, the, is it kind of implied that the mom is only lucid at night? Like that idea of like the moon That's what coming I gathered. up and there's that lucidity coming back for those big yeah. moments. Okay. I wouldn't. Me, I can't say definitively, but yeah. they make it. She, he gets home that first night, and she just clicked, comes out of it. So, exactly. Yeah. For me, I was like, okay, so either she is choosing when to snap out of it because that's when she would need to protect Kubo the most is at night. So she she comes to lucidity at that point because she knows she needs to protect Kubo, or because she's a moon witch, mm -hmm. her her magic is most powerful at night. So it's like charging her and she can kind of snap out of it or something so during the day the moon is far away from her and she's disconnected right but i mean that was my moon... assumption but yeah I, again, it's it's not explicitly said at any time it's also not something that's necessarily important but it is kind of fun to to theorize upon me like oh yeah her, her moon magic she needs the moon to get her magic and like in her mind yeah that blow to the head seemed to have something to do with it but the whole the whole crux of the movie is like people especially her parents just like forget and i feel like if she had lived longer maybe she, and and the the events of this movie don't happen the longer they stay in the cave but she goes fully catatonic and fully like but it, it really played like like this this movie has a lot of themes of loss obviously this would mm -hmm. be a great movie to show a kid dealing with the death of a grandparent i think um <clears throat> to sort of have or a parent or yeah. a parent <laughs> to have them sort of wrap their head around it. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, the important message at the end of the movie is that, like, magic is magic, but, like, memories are the most powerful magic of all. And, like, you know, everybody lives on through memories. And it's, like, that's sort of, sort of the idea is, like, lo losing memories happens to everybody in this, but they're still acting innately through this sort of, like, subconscious memory. Like, you know, when you meet Hanzo for the first time, he doesn't know who he is, but he instinctually wants to protect Kubo and his wife, even though he doesn't know that, that he is important to them in any way he is. And he knows that he is. Did you guys uh, figure it out real fast? Because I did not. <laughs> I did. I mean, it is, it's, you know, I'm not, I'm, this is not meant to be a diss or anything. It is relatively like <laughs> telegraphed to you. I know, like... but I didn't figure out that, Hanzo was the dad until the I saw the picture on the the villa when they get to like the old house. Mm -hmm. The mom was pretty obvious because it's this it's the same voice, right? It's Charlie's Theron for both the mom and the monkey. But yeah. even still, I, when when they're in that whale, um, I didn't know. I was so like, what is happening here? That I, but it all makes sense. And so, some other stuff that I like noticed watching it again was like they talk about how like I was so heartbroken. Spoilers, guys, 
But I was so heartbroken when they die, when the parents die as their beetle and monkey form later in the movie. I didn't, I had forgotten they had a conversation earlier that's like, we're magic, this magic's fading, you know, like, this is all going to go away. So the second time I watched it, I didn't have that like, oh no, the parents are dead. The parents were already gone. These are like those ghost manifestations that sort yeah, of... Kubo has already, has, has basically already mourned the death of both right. his parents at this point, And he's just, they're, they are memories of his parents, right? And they're not, their forms are not the same as he would have known them in life. Um and it's him losing them again is obviously super duper tragic because it's, it's like, heartbreaking. Yeah. You're like, oh, you just got them back. Like you could have just had a lovely life with your like beetle and monkey parents. <laughs> Appropriately <laughs> named beetle and monkey. Yeah. yeah. Mr. Monkey when mom I, and beetle dad. I did not realize it was Charlie Theron until the monkey form. And I had to look it up. I love Charlie Theron. I think I truly will watch anything that this woman is in. I went to the Louvre in Paris, and despite the beautiful things around me, I looked out the window and there was a giant Jador Dior um, billboard outside. I was like stunning, like absolutely stunning. <laughs> this is what a work of art! Yeah. <laughs> this museum. Um, so I loved it. I thought she did a great job, and I did really love that she was just monkey. Like they just kept the name monkey. I was like, yeah. it's close to mom. Is that yeah. kind monkey. of giving it away a bit? Monkey. But the like the mo- like when she's in her mom form to what steve was saying like she's a full fully protective and then like the essence of her goes into the the monkey statue with her magic becomes full protection and the monkey character is just like protective to a fault almost then we see a little bit of the flirtation between the beetle and monkey you know like it's just so good at the point of the movie we're at though it is the point where he does do this this story out of origami the origami dance tells the story of hands of the mighty samurai um, I made a note. This is incredible. The whole story about the samurai getting the special pieces of gear, the different monsters. I made a note about Origami King there. The final boss is the Moon King, um, and right before they end, we see it. We see like a shadow of the Moon King forming, um, and then the bell rings, and Kubo has to run home. You gotta go before the moon comes. Before the moon comes. <laughs> Um, I, I particularly like this as well because, you know, it's the, the villagers are complaining like, no, not again. And like one guy is like, people love an ending. They need an ending. And he's like, gotta go. The, but the, the, reason... main, uh, the main guy of the town is uh, played by George Takai. And I don't know if you notice, I, I don't, forget if it's at the beginning or at the end, we get a hard almost right into the camera. Oh, my. Which yep. I thought was. He probably should have been in the movie more considering yep. considering what the movie is. It's like I don't want to get yeah. too into this, but it's interesting that uh, Matthew McConaughey is one of the characters. <laughs> Got to say all white care. voices. The yeah. whitest all... man. Yeah. There I think George Takai is the only Japanese like if you look at the list on your Kubo poster. Yeah. Um, oh, definitely. He, he's he was, he's he had a few lines, like a handful. It's wild that he's on the poster and he has maybe like five lines of dialogue in the entire movie. Perhaps it was to sit there and be like, we promised we didn't just do only white people. Yeah. We got we got a couple Asian people, I swear to God. George Takei's in it. See, he's on the poster. What I was wondering was like, what was the choice? Because this this movie could have been like... This movie was like right... Right at that point, where was, was right at the beginning where people were really kind of starting to call in Hollywood on it. Yeah. Um, and you know, not to say that that's an excuse, but I think that if this movie was made today, decisions would probably be a little bit different in terms of the cast, but also the cast did a really good job, it was true, excellent, and uh. But imagine yeah, if I don't this know. Was it's it's like kind a of like full... a it's a thing we can we can talk about, but it's also like I don't know. Imagine it like a, a, <laughs> yeah, but it happened a lot if it back was then. A full like Japanese production or or even Asian production, and it was it was fully like realized that way. I think it would be even more special than it is. It's great that they're highlighting Japanese folklore, obviously, right? But I think it could have been it could have elevated it. In fact, it's like my only critique of this movie, really. Like, spoilers. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get to my review at the end, but that's the only real problem I had with this thing. That it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a little bit more, like there wasn't more more culture put into it. I guess. 
Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Um, I think this movie did get quite a bit of backlash for the cast at the time. And, and it, like I said, it was just sort of when when the studios had started calling out this kind of behavior in Hollywood. But you also have to consider the fact that these movies take like six years to make. So they had and they always do the recording for this stuff beforehand because they need to animate to the voiceover. So the voice actors would have recorded like in like 2011, yeah. you know, so it's like, oh, yeah, we can't just go back and redo that. Um, I again, wanna, I, I, I feel like I'm defending it. And I don't like. Yeah. I feel icky. I'm like, I'm like, I need to take a shower after this. Um, at any yeah. rate, I took a shower before this because I was like, Ugh, this is gonna be. We have to address it at least. But yeah, the uh, the part of the story now is what we talked about previously, where she sort of uh, the mother sort of lights up at night, kind of comes to out of her catatonic state, um, and she's the one that's telling Kubo the story that he then goes and relates to the town through the use of of origami which that first twist almost for me though like a little bit of a like whoa that's really cool like i i was wondering where he was getting if it was just an over act of imagination if it, if it was coming from somewhere some book or something but nope at night they have dinner she kind of comes out of it and and keeps telling the story although unfortunately her um recount of the of the tale has become somewhat yeah uh i i also wanted to say about the the origami story that he tells in, in the town it's like the reason he never finishes is because he doesn't know yeah. the end of the story right and because his mom doesn't know the end of the story and she never finishes it as well but also the story he's telling is literally his own story that we're about to see unfold so he doesn't unfold? know the end of the story as well unfold oh my god i see what i did there by accident um <laughs> And, you know, that's kind of the, the that whole storytelling moment is foreshadowing without fore foreshadowing so clearly, right? Like it's giving you the MacGuffins, as you said, but it's also telling you that he's going to have to defeat certain elements in order to obtain them. But also it doesn't at all. It, no. it just gives you like sort of like completely different. It's almost like watching a movie trailer and then you go in and then everything is different for the movie, except it's kind of the same a little bit. So it, it's a spider, a shark, um, and, a chicken. A, and, a chi and the flame throwing chicken. In yeah. reality, in reality, it's a skeleton, a nightmare, sea monster. Um, and what was the third one? Uh, just the like burnt down. Dragon thing, right? It's, 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 like, it's more like the, the, the ant. The sisters. Yeah. But then the final battle is kind of like uh, like a demon koi fish or something. It reminded me of the Chaturi like monsters and Avengers. You know that are flying around the city that Hulk like grabs out of the sky. No, no, no Avengers one fans. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think the koi fish was more appropriate. More, more, pro more apt. <laughs> I think it was based on an actual like like a dinosaur not a dinosaur like a not a trilobite what's the word i'm looking for it's like based off a real creature like an, an ancient pre-us creature like a it's uh, prehistoric it's prehistoric the word i'm looking for yeah i would say <laughs> it looked like a like a i know what you mean like some sort of megalodon or something some yeah it was of... it's almost like it's like a bug and a fish and mm -hmm. it's kind of like a human it hand has like for a therapist tail. on the outside too yeah. so it's like hard yeah and so it's, cool, the face is kind of human like like it looks very angry um and you know it does like the the yin yang in the moon when it goes up and like folds around in the moon for a mm -hmm. second there and you're just like they're doing so much with this monster right now that i and the glow oh my god the glow the, that's the, the teal the, color well yeah and just like the lighting in that entire sequence even when pre-monster grandpa when he's just having the conversation with him has that glow the glow and and like you know, when you when you think about how they make these movies, you're like, this is probably just a, a puppet that's been, you know, painted pure blue and white. And then they are either reflect pumping, light. Yeah, somehow light, reflecting yeah. light off of it. I, I don't know. Or like using glow in the dark paint and illuminating it. Could be. Yeah, it looks amazing, though. Um, anyway, I'm jumping too far ahead. It's true. We're doing a lot of jumping around <laughs> in this one. I, I, my notes, like, I don't have a lot of notes. So, like, if we just stick to the... Stick to the plan, Franz. Uh, Moon King is grandfather. The sisters are evil as well. Um, you must always st stay hidden. That's basically what the mom explains. Um, that's why you have to come home at dusk. Never go yeah. after dark. The moon is watching you. 
One you know of those that giant that... thing in the sky that takes up most of the sky? It can see what you're doing all the time. Also, when do like, kids ever listen to their parents' hard rules, you know? Yeah. We would but have least... no movies if kids listened to their it's parents' true. intense it's rules. True. If but Coraline also, you... just like went to sleep that night and lived her shitty existence, well... Don't yeah. feed the gremlins after dark or get them wet, you know? Yeah, it's let all... them watch TV. <laughs> it's all there. The rules of gremlins, though, let's be real, are a little bit like very specific for what happens in that one scene in that movie. But also like, like uh, obviously they make movies for kids, but they're not, they're on the, the they're on the cusp of what, like the, yeah. the cutoff point of when it would then become a movie for not kids, you know? Um, Gremlins that's why toes I, that line real hard. Uh, Gremlins is, <laughs> that's a real The mom puts PG-13. a Gremlin in a, yeah. in a, in a blender and a saw blade goes right next to uh, Ralph Macchio. I don't think I would show an eight-year-old Gremlins, but I would definitely show an eight-year-old Kubo in the district. I would show a 10-year-old Gremlins, which I think is when I watched it. Well, that's why I said eight. <laughs> the um, sisters were so creepy like yeah. so perfectly i'm so sorry that was my dog um, <laughs> so perfectly creepy um oh i loved mm-hmm. them i loved them so much i was like i want to be this for halloween <laughs> i remember yeah i remember when the trailer came out seeing them in the trailer for the first time that was like the selling point for me immediately when i saw that i was like i'm seeing this movie those two whatever they are look so sick i need to see this movie i was kind of bummed that they weren't um like more different but they are very different because they kind of have different motivations the first one of course is like you know i've never been defeated the only person to feed me was my sister and the way that and she fights this like crazy battle and then the second sister comes with double revenge on her mind and then so i just want to correct you rage um she doesn't say my sister defeated me she says the only time i've ever lost is when i lost my sister so she's not saying that her sister defeated her she's saying that she lost her sister so that's that yeah i misinterpreted that because that that sequence is intense so she like the only feeling of loss that she's ever had is when she lost her sister and she's fighting her sister in monkey form the monkey form it's... When they're fighting, though, and the face gets cracked, I didn't realize they were masks until that moment. Then I, I was like, oh, wow. I thought they were just like these creepy three moon gods. Frozen children. face people, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, I love that cracked mask, too. And like the, too. the anger you can now, because it's like this neutral sort of smirk, right? The, the entire time. And then when you see the actual grimacing mouth giving it away true emotion underneath. So cool, so cool, so smart, so good. That's one of the that's one of the things that was telegraphed that I didn't know. I was like, those look like Vega's mask from Street Fighter, <laughs> or hexadecimal, or hexadecimal, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is um, great. fun fact about the sisters' costume though, because I, I did watch behind the scenes things. It was just too cool not to. Um, mm-hmm. Their amazing capes are made by interlacing or weaving piano wire. And then putting these little feathers individually to make this crazy cape, so then it can do these amazing bends and kind of like contractions, and it was so cool. Like the amount, again, just the amount of thought that goes into like each particular thing to get the movement that they want is beautiful. They didn't yeah. have to give them these sweet capes. <laughs> they could have had static cape with no movement. Right? <laughs> yeah, and I would have been fine with that too. I know. And then but... this one, I'm just like. Yeah, it's the fine. reveal, the reveal of the two sisters with the capes billowing in the wind. Like, I'm like, I know this is stop frame, but holy shit, I need to just stop here and rewind and appreciate the movement of these capes because it's so satisfying. Um, just the thought of be a, a movie that I just put on to show people. Yeah. The other movies I think are if very to... visually stunning, but like this one, this is this is the second newest one, right? Missing Link is the newest. My yeah. problem with Missing Link is it almost felt too, <clears throat> it looked too much like CGI, even though it was obvious. Like it's, if you watch it, you know that it's stop motion. But this is like the peak of it still looking like, like figures, figurines and stuff being moved, mm-hmm. being manipulated. It doesn't have as much of the um, CGI fixing that I think um, Missing Link might have had because Missing Link is indistinguishable from CGI. Is kind yeah, of... it's like they got too good at stop frame. Yeah. Like, damn it, <laughs> people don't realize. You need that sweet spot where you're kind of like, wow, this is stop frame, but yeah. I can't almost not believe it. Yeah, but you like the moments where you know monkey is scratching, and you can see the fur movement, and she pulls out a, a tick or whatever and eats it. Or um, when her hair is blowing, or when she like wakes up yeah. in the morning, her hair is all disheveled, and she like fixes it. 
Yeah, and it's it looks stunning and beautiful. And but I I think that like this movie in particular, like it's almost an argument for the medium as as an an art form, right? To like show people like look at what you can do with stop frame and how beautiful it can be. Uh because there are people who still are just like, well, why would you why not just animate it? And it's like, because look, look how much cooler it looks when you have people who are passionate about their yeah. craft working on it. And they're um, they're not just feeding like ideas into a computer and then animating it, you know. And it's going to get so much worse with with AI. Yeah, like and CGI I mean not to movies. not to stomp on on animation because it's all, obviously there are tons and tons of animated movies that are amazing and you know heartfelt and warm and wonderful. But there's something about stop frame that just feels right to me yeah. and like it, it has far more impact on me emotionally. We're, we're also big fans of practical effects on this show. Um, when did you see that interview with the guy from the bear who's playing uh, the thing in the new Fantastic Four? And this guy comes on to a talk show and says, You know, when people do the costumes, you know, I'm gonna be full CGI as the thing. When they do costumes, it feels like you know, Comic Con. I wrote that dude off so hard because, yeah, Michael Chiklis looks kind of ridiculous in the Thing outfit in the first two Fantastic Four movies. But those movies are campy and weird and of an era. I think right. that they could do a practical thing. You're telling me that in a Marvel movie, they're not <laughs> going to use practical effects on something? That's very Also, to do like a mixture, right? Like, you don't have to be completely in the outfit. But, like, I feel like maybe it lends to feeling a bit more like that giant character. Yeah. How do you feel like the thing if you're just standing as you, you know? Exactly. And it, you need to be a little uncomfortable. You're a bunch yeah. of rocks. Like, you're a rock <laughs> man, yeah. At least Mark Ruffalo used the giant fists. So you know? funny. Yeah. I could buy those at the store. So <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, back in the cave, uh, she gives Kubo the monkey, the little wood monkey says uh, keep this with you at all times mr and monkey don't go out into the dark or else uh well, so oh this is what i wanted to the say dark. no i'm just kidding. she 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 explains to him why though in many of the movies that we mentioned earlier they never tell the kid why they just give them the rule instead of explaining why like she's she full-on says like my sisters will come and take your eye yeah <laughs> and you'll die and you're like, okay. That's true, actually. Yeah. Like, so, he is aware of the consequences to yeah. his actions. It's not like every kid's movie ever where they're like, don't feed him after midnight or else. It's like, or else what? And he's like, I'm not going to tell you why. My store's closed now. Most movies, they don't because I guess they want the reveal or whatever, right? Of what the, the stakes are. But Kubo is very smart. So he asks a lot of questions. And it would be unbelievable for him to not want to know what those consequences are. So that you just give them the consequences and also giving us that threat before we even see what the threat is, is great because you're like, what, who are these monstrous people that are coming? Are they going to be, you know, gross monsters? Are they going to be weird creepos? Turns out they're both. They're <laughs> but, you know, little column A, little column B. Yeah. Mostly... Kind of sexy. Like, it's yeah, kind of hot. Yeah. What's going on? I mean, yeah, I was feeling all sorts of feelings for Coraline. Hexadecimal the... was a weird sexual awakening for me. It's true. <laughs> like it's it's a great mask. Everybody go out and buy that mask. The <laughs> she the mom goes back into catatonic state. Their masks are kind of like masks of her face as well. You know, like they're we never I don't think we see the sisters full face at any point but no, when we no. do see it they're almost like undead they've got like that blue skin yeah they look like the grandpa looks when he shows up they're like they're like ghosts like but, it's almost like they're made of moonlight or something yeah but the mom is very much very human very like you know um she's got that that porcelain complexion much like the masks and I think that their masks are meant to be sort of a reference to the sister. There's probably, if this was like an animated movie, like animated by CGI or animated by something that wasn't so difficult and they could do sequels or like, you know, make more of the story, there would probably be a backstory about the masks. I was thinking about this a lot because the problem, the big problem with Laika is like, you're not going to get sequels to things because I the watched movie. I... interview today. He just went, no sequels. <laughs> yeah. So loud, so determined. I'm like, you know what? I respect that. Like, I was going to say, I don't think story. that's the problem with Laika. I think that's one of the best parts about Laika is we don't have to like have a post credit sequence that sets up, I don't know, Kubo meets the, the missing verse. link or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Which would be a great movie. <laughs> 
I think it's yeah. so tough because when you have a story you love or like a movie you love, you obviously want more. Like there's a part of you that yeah. wants more, but so many times you look at it and you're like, no, this is amazing because they did it in this one story. So it's kind of like a war with yourself, you know, you're mm-hmm. like, I want that sequel, but I understand the reasons you're not doing it. I'm, yeah. I have Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, the second part of the remake came out today and I started playing it for like 15 minutes and I yelled out, this is wrong! <laughs> Because my memory of the original Final Fantasy yeah. VII, it's still good. Like I'm still excited. And then you to went and took it. a shower. Like, this is wrong. Like, oh, wash it off. Ah. It. Yeah. Like this is horrible. No, it's actually amazing. But uh, I, you're right. Sometimes, like if you watch this at the right age, it's going to stay with you forever, and it's going to be its own thing. Um, Big Trouble in Little China. I, when we covered that movie, I couldn't believe I hadn't seen it when I was a kid. That doesn't have any sequels, arguably. <laughs> I watched that for the first time as an adult and like could not stop laughing. It's that crazy. It's just an absolute riot start to finish. It's like a yeah. Ninja Turtles movie without any Ninja Turtles in it. Nice. But I, it's one of those things that if you watch at the right age, it's just... Well, the reason the Ninja Turtles aren't in it is because it takes place in San Francisco, not in New York. Right. If they were in New it York... It's a long city. Yeah. Right. Exactly. It's like exactly the same... Anyway, it's the same like <laughs> universe almost as the second yeah. Ninja Turtles. Well, the movie. Ghostbusters also exist in this universe. It's, it all feels like it's the same if place. the comic you know? books are canon, they meet each other through a portal. Mm. <laughs> and, any, and at any rate, um, <clears throat> she goes back into the catatonic state and the day is done. She dreams that night. Uh, and that's why the paper is flying around the, the previous time. Yeah. And uh, she can't remember. Here's one thing that I want to ask you guys. Why doesn't he just pull his guitar out and play a little ditty to pick up all those papers? Why does he got to do it one by one? I don't know because if he knows you... how to do it yet. <laughs> I think that it's because you have to use your power responsibly. Yeah. And I think cleaning up with your power while easy and fun, not responsible. Yeah. You can't pull a Madeline. Is it Madeline? Right. I was going to say yeah. Mary Poppins, but I guess they have the same power. <laughs> it's funny that you guys say that, though, because as soon as he realizes he has all this power, like coming up, he f- makes that. Giant well, he already group knows of he has the power. He freaking put on a whole with show monkey. in town. I know, but That's it's different. True. Like he's trying to busk to. I mean, he doesn't make any For money bread. off of it. Yeah, yeah he does. He gets, he's got some yeah. coins in that. In that. Also, world. clearly magic is normal because the people were like, wow, this is astounding, yeah, this is but perfectly... nobody was like, hunt the witch, you know? Yeah. Like, <laughs> this isn't Paranorman. <laughs> no. Um, that's like the opposite of this movie. Yeah. Well, and that's kind of one of the things I really like about it is like magic is just normal. I always love a movie where magic is just normal because it's like we don't have to have the magical reveal where everyone's like, well, because you've seen it a thousand times. It's just like, no, he just has a magical guitar. That's that's the world that we live in here. He goes in here every day and plays a song and everyone loves it. And then he goes home. No one else has magic, apparently, <laughs> except for him. We don't well. know. Yeah. There's probably other, you know, magical people in the world, but we don't see them in this movie. This is Kubo's story. Yeah. Kubo and the two strings. So Kubo goes back to town after um, the next day, basically. And the old lady, he's like, well, what? I'm not allowed to come here at night. And the old lady is like, you know, at night there's fireworks and we go to the river. We go to the graveyard and we send all of our loved ones down the river and lanterns, paper, paper lanterns. And Kubo's like, are you fucking shitting me? That sounds incredible. Um, <clears throat> so he decides that he wants to try this out. It's pretty. He wants to make a lantern for his dad. Yeah, it's, it's a it, festival, right? It's some sort of festival. Yeah, it's like a yearly event, I, mm-hmm. I suppose. Yeah, I took it as every single night. <laughs> no, every night they do it. They're, that town has a dangerous shortage of paper. <laughs> yeah, and there's constant explosions in the sky. The animals are losing their minds. The river is polluted with just like <laughs> so foggy, paper. wet paper. <laughs> yeah, the turtles are dying. <laughs> <laughs> there's uh, a ban on paper in this town. Like a week later, yeah. so many forest fires. Yeah. Oh no. I thought that they were going to be those uh, those little lanterns that you paper lanterns you light and go up into the sky, but they were the kind that you put in the water and they float down. Yeah, I think those are Chinese, aren't they? The ones that go in the sky. <clears throat> yeah, that's right. Or whatever the people are entangled. Entangled, yeah, right. <laughs> it's not a white I assume lady Swedish, with long hair. yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> Swedish or something. If you guys ever do that movie, call me back. I'm an expert. <laughs> I'm tangled. Okay. Oh, yeah. t- a resident tangled <laughs> expert. Yeah. I think if we ever do like a Disney month, I'd like to do the, the like off the beaten path ones. And that would be so tangled. tangled and like the black cauldron Prin- princess and the frog. Oh yeah. Cauldron. That's a good movie. Beautiful movie. And uh, the one with the dread. Keith the David's scene. in it. We have done Keith David movies so many times, so in this, many times. on this Quest, podcast. Is Quest for Camelot Disney or am I wrong? Is it I think that's animated? a. I think that's a Bluth movie. Okay. It's like the people who made. Um... I sing the songs from Quest for Camelot way too often. <laughs> right. It's it's like uh, you know like there was Disney and then there was the Bluth movies like the they were always like people would confuse them for Disney movies like Fern Gully and. Um, yep. <laughs> Where they, there's like a ton of them, but they're all weird and they all have kind of horny energy to them. <laughs> like you're just like, this is why Disney, do all the but... women have cleavage in these kids' yeah. animated <laughs> films? <laughs> um, yeah, I thought Ferngully was a Disney movie, and then I got don't go back and watch that episode because it's very embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> I got duped by that. Uh, somebody made poster. like a fake poster for a Ferngully live action, and it says Disney, and I I was com- so confused. And then we went to a class about media awareness. So everybody go media to media literacy, media yeah. literacy, media awareness classes and learn about it because your parents are getting duped by AI as we speak. They're typing amen under a picture. Well, of the a thing that gave it away for me is when you started babies, listing it's the horrible. actors, you started listing the actors that were in this movie. I'm like, there's no way it's no not <laughs> real, man. This is not a real movie. And I'm not stupid. Like I'm a smart, <laughs> I think I'm an intelligent person. I, we grew I, up in the age of internet. We are savvy. Yeah. I think I wanted it more. Yeah. You got tricked because you want, you liked yeah. the idea. You're like, oh, this looks sick. Fer, Fern Gully formative movie. I saw it in theaters. First time I ever had jelly bellies. Boom. That's the recipe yeah. for it, for a memory. Yeah, you were like live action Fern Gully coming out in 2026, starring Robin Williams. Like, Wait a minute! <laughs> Wait a minute! That should have been the the giveaway. Yeah, that would have been hilarious if I fell for that. <laughs> uh, so Kubo goes to the graveyard. He learns about respecting the dead. Uh, he sets up a lantern that allows him to talk to his dad, but the dad doesn't respond. That's when I was like, "What is this movie about now?" If this if was the mother been spinning a lie this whole time? He makes the saddest little lantern because he doesn't have one. Like he makes one that just looks like, a, like it's, it's, it's really not going to survive on the water. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the tiny little, yeah, it looks like an envelope that got I think that's blue the reason into. his dad didn't answer. He was like, do better. <laughs> yeah. do better. You got to make a better lantern, man. Uh, the sun is rapidly going down. So are we going to say something, Tatiana? I didn't mean to. Mm-mm. Okay. I always, uh, when I look away and I start reading my notes, I'm, I'm concerned that somebody's trying to say words. Generally, just clearing my throat, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. So they they send their lanterns down the water. Uh, he hears the bell and has to get home. And then I think at this point, he's like already crumpled up his lanterns. Like, screw you, dad. You're useless. And this lantern's useless and everything sucks. And then it becomes nighttime and it becomes a horror movie. Yes. Briefly. The best part of the movie. When the sisters appear, it. that's your. That's Wait, your well, do we think that his dad didn't answer because his dad wasn't actually dead? I think Is, like, so. Is that a reason? I okay. think so. That's really cool. He got or, transformed into a bug. Or, yeah. His dad can't remember. He was manifested as the bug through magic, so, like, his soul is sort of alive it's a little bit unclear if he died and then they took his spirit and turned it into or if a bug they just lied that he died and changed yeah him. or if he just got mutated into a bug via magic um what is clear is that they stole his memories yeah. and that's very sad that's <laughs> but they couldn't they couldn't steal his passion or his love for his family which is beautiful and they made his um, voice uh, matthew mcconaughey which uh, i couldn't figure it out man I thought it was Tim Allen for a bit. I thought it was George Clooney. He sounded like Batman to me. That's pretty good. Um, that is a pretty good friggin' guess because I was trying to like match the mouth to like face different actors' faces, and I would have. That's a really good. That's. A really I good honestly, guess. I honestly guess George Clooney, and when I saw uh, Matthew McConaughey, I I still really can't see it. Nope. <laughs> Watching it a second time, I was like, that's how really but you can hear the little twang in his voice when you when you know it's him i think when this movie came out i was working on a matthew mcconaughey impression so i was like listening (laughs) to a lot of people doing impressions of him so i knew it was him immediately that's great i'm not gonna do it tatiana of course was working when batman uh and robin came out she was working on a uh, impression of george clooney (laughs) of robin (laughs) of of batman bruce wayne specifically batman Mm -hmm. i'm batman 
That's my a George Clooney Batman impersonation. I'm Batman. Yeah. Hello, I'm Batman. Hello, I'm Batman. Robin, you better not steal my girlfriend, Poison Ivy. That's my impression of that whole movie. Yeah, that's pretty much the plot. Pretty much. Oh, here comes our niece or something. It's Batgirl and Alicia oh, Silverstone. Like, Bane is in a disguise. He's wearing a trench coat and a, a fedora, <laughs> but he's still got his Bane costume just on. Like an, <laughs> just like a Ninja Turtle. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he's, he's trying to get home, but he doesn't, the, it becomes nighttime. The Kubo sisters, uh, the, they're not his sisters. The sisters invade with the, his spooky, aunts, his aunts invade with their spooky ghost smoke tentacles and they just destroy the town. The mom jumps into action. She charges up her, like also moon ability with her, one of her final breaths. She puts the dragonfly wings on Kubo. He gets flown away he can see down into the battle the sisters and the mom just clash i guess they destroy the mom unfortunately um i was the this was the next part where my emotions were raging because of how good it all looked and how great of a story it was becoming nari was and this is like a one of the hardest act breaks i've ever seen in a movie like the fade to white and then fade back in and he's in like a like frozen area like face to face with like this like monkey this is a good fade to black moment it's like i re- i don't really like those very often in movies but this is a, a part where it's completely appropriate and i love that he just appears in, in a world that is completely alien to him like it's it's com- it's the, the complete opposite of where he was <laughs> he's in a nice beautiful town surrounded by a thick uh, lush forest and a, a beautiful river and now he's in a wintry hellscape, just surrounded by a blizzard. And I'm wondering how they would have filmed, like a, a like a like an icy blizzard like this. I love the way blizzards look on screen in video games, animated. Just for whatever reason, maybe it's because I'm from Canada and I love a I love snow, a blizzard and a snowy day. I think this would be one of the moments where they're using. Uh, like digital techniques in order to to accomplish a blizzard but you know they they still have to do everything to make them look like they're in a blizzard um i don't i don't know like i'm pretty sure they they can't stop frame animate a blizzard that would be impossible they could i guess they could put the blizzard in front digitally and and then have in the background sort of some practical snow effects blistering or blistering around yeah, they'll they'll it. be some some things will be there, and then they'll add more to to thicken it, right? Like to mm-hmm. make it look more violent. But it was so violent, like it immediately feels like you're watching, like not just like it's kind of snowy, or it's kind of a blizzard. The, the the foreignness that you feel watching him wake up in this world, and you're going, is he going to immediately get? hypothermia is he gonna you know what i mean like that's all i was concerned for this case yeah, they don't really just, address the temperature they're like just, no it's yeah, just violently it, it's, windy it's fine <laughs> because you're he, going to send your kids somewhere like maybe you have to like take a look what's send the them to a temperature beach. in that space yeah. well he came from a semi-tropical you know like a japanese archipelago kind of a place right yeah, I think that the you know she she was sending him closer to where he needed to be to, to obtain the artifacts uh, that he needs to defeat his grandfather. They make it to a dead whale. Dead whale in the middle of a mountain, I yeah. guess maybe, which and is cool. We how did it get there? I don't know. <laughs> and how is it? How are, how is the monkey eating it? And also, it smells horrible. It's frozen. Oh yes, right. Yeah, I saw he this freeze. movie. Yeah, I watched it. <laughs> Um, I've had the th- same thought. I'm like, wouldn't this be rotted? And I'm like, well, I guess it's in the middle of a blizzard. <laughs> so maybe it's really cold. We get a little bit of comedy here because she's like, listen, don't mention the smell. I know it's going to smell horrible. But as a monkey, my smell ability is like 200 times yours. Yeah. And it's really the like- driest. I love monkeys brand of comedy in this movie because I love dry comedy. Every time that she delivers a line... You have to be like, is is that, is she serious right now? So I think yes. that's the part of the protection thing, you know, like it has to, she can be dry and funny, but still has to be like teaching a lesson. <laughs> yeah. Um, I am also unclear if monkey immediately knows that she's her mom or his Kubo's mom, that's or okay. if 
it's slowly coming to her as she goes through. Cause it seems like when she has the realization, it is a realization and it's not just like, I've known this whole time and I just haven't told anybody, but there's also the argument that can be made that she does know. And she just doesn't want to let Kubo know because she doesn't want him to have the sense of hope knowing that the magic is going to wear off eventually. And she's going to turn back into a little trinket or whatever. Right. Yeah. That's I a, think it's the first one, but I don't know. That's a good point, though. I like that. I like that. Um, also, watching Kubo's face watch the monkey in the inside the whale was really funny because he's he's like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like I don't even. Monkey don't even also has the best at. like facial expressions. I think throughout the the entirety of like getting to know her, it kind of softens a bit, right? Even Charlize Theron like changes her tone in voice to be lower a little bit more stoic. The cadence is a little stronger and sharp. Mean, I guess you could call it. Um, and it works so well because if you didn't know both of them were Charlize Theron before, it might it might not click until she starts to soften up a little bit that it was the same voice actor because she's not doing the same voice. No. She's changing it pretty drastically. Which I think is also lending to your theory that um, she doesn't realize that she's the mom yet. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah she has like a she has like a don't fuck with me face. Like <laughs> yeah. it's just like I will take no fuss from you. Yeah. Kind of like the half eyelid like squint most of it. And she's constantly doing like a sideways like like just kind of like what the fuck face? Yeah. What the hell's wrong with you? Just listen to me. I know better. Well, all through this I didn't is... expect my day to start inside of a dead whale. Yeah. Yeah. So we're both having a bad day right now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I also don't like whale gut soup. So just drink it. <laughs> like all through this exchange too. She's like, I'll give you three questions because I know this is a lot. And yeah. he's like, who are you? Mr. Monkey. And she's like, whatever. And that's a bit of a comedic back and forth. I'm not going to try to do the conversation. But she essentially gets to the point. She's like, look, I'm just going to lay it out for you. Your mom, with her, her last breath, you know, sent you here and put um, put her last remaining magic into the, the, the wooden monkey. And he's still like, what are you talking about? And he's like, you don't recognize me? Yeah, I'm the monkey, Mr. I'm monkey. It's Mr. me. Mr. Monkey. Uh, uh, I, is... I also like that in this conversation, she reinstates the same stuff that um, Kubo's mother was saying earlier, only just like 10 times more aggressively and bluntly. Yeah. Just like, if they find us, they're going to kill me and then they're going to cut out your eye and your then kill eye. you. Yeah, yeah, And this... then take you to the moon and turn you into a, a demon god. A moon Nazi or something. Yeah. Um the the reason I say that is because the way the mom and the monkey presented is like the moon king wants everybody to be like created in his image. It's kind of like the uh, the other Sasquatches from the Missing Link, how they're like this closed off, like you know they want to stay among their own people, but this is like the the moon father wants to shut off the the kid's ability to like be empathetic to other people that aren't moon people feels a little bit fourth reichy you know third sure, reich yeah. one of the reichs it's, nope i think it's the third one <laughs> yeah um also the the monkey mentions that the sisters don't eat they don't sleep they don't stop um they want it's like the, a terminator pretty much a couple of tournament a couple of friggin' terminators over here. They want the uh they get the, the armor and the helmet and the sword together so we can stop the Moon King. And <clears throat> this is where the um monkey pulls a strand of her hair out and is like uh, No, Kubo grabbed it when he was flying away. He grabbed oh, his mom's yes. hair. Right. He he was like, I have this. He makes it she makes a bracelet out of it. The first string of the two strings. Yep. Spoilers. <laughs> I thought he was going to string his chamisen with it. And I was like, ooh, put that string on there. And then he yeah. put it on his wrist. I'm like, fashionable bracelet. So absolutely, there we go. Well, you get it. He, he does that later. So he, he, he does eventually do it. I'm watching this whole movie going, the two strings is the chamisen, right? Like the, but the chamisen has three strings. It <laughs> yeah. drove me crazy for at, like an hour and a yeah. half. 
Yeah, I mean, there there is weirdly like contention about it, but I, I mean, like you can read it several different ways, right? You can read it as like the literal two strings that he cap he he gathers one from his mother's head and the other his father's bowstring. Those are the two strings, and then the third string is him. Is him yeah. um, but then also it's like you know the characters in the movie are the strings. They're like tying him. They're all, they're tying. He's tied to the two of them via the strings, kind of thing. His mm-hmm. mother and his father. It's you know. It's just basic storytelling, guys. It's symbolism. It's a metaphor. Come on. So, um, but on it's, this... it's so good. Like, it's so simple, but it's so good. And it also can mean, like, 20 different things if you think about it for more than, you know, for more than you should. <laughs> yeah, like which like, hmm. I believe we all have. And that's where what could this two strings that they refer to be? Two hour and a half podcast about it. Yeah. Um, that night, Kubo uh, is asleep. Uh, and I guess he now has the ability to... So the way that I interpret it is the mom didn't have any, all she was meant to do was, was guard Kubo from the family. But since Kubo is now on an adventure, the manifestation of the paper while he's sleeping in the dream stuff is sort of meant to teach him about his powers. And when he wakes up, monkey kind of wakes up like, what the hell did you create? And it's this little tiny origami, the origami uh, soldier or samurai from his story. And she, but it's way better. It's way better. And Kubo's like, when my mom was asleep, she never created anything. She just strewed paper everywhere, which I liked. It was a good touch. Um, an evolution of like the mom to son, mm-hmm. passing the passing the magic, passing the what the magic is and how it manifests. And also, these are like things that he had he was creating for that busking story he was doing anyway, right? Um, and uh, but we also find out later that it's, I mean, not even that much later, just a couple of moments later and that it's, it's manifested into a version of his father. Right? Exactly, like it's, yeah. it's taking on the form of his dad to and guide that him. Moment, I... Yeah. And yeah. he's, yeah, he's like the, the compass from Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> and then that, at that moment too, I thought, oh, there's the dad. And th- that's where yeah. that ended for the, even when they meet Beetle, I'm like that. Yeah. The Hanzo is the, it's the origami, right? We'll get to we'll get to that and more. Yeah, they try and treat it like a red herring a little bit, where it's like you meet the beetle and it looks a lot like Hanzo, but then you know you're like, oh, but he says he worked for Hanzo. He was like his his master or whatever. He was one Hanzo of the was samurai that. He thinks. Yeah. he thinks that, yeah. Um, but then if you notice, the little red guy after this moment is almost always sitting on Beetle's horns or on his shoulder, like for the rest of the movie. He's always like attached to him. Um. So that that's kind of like a a little bit of a hint, like you know that they're they're now always together. That's a really good. I I think I subconsciously noticed that, and I was thinking about it, but I didn't like visually notice it. But that's uh, even when they're eating fish, yeah. he's like throwing the fish into Beetle's mouth and stuff. I thought it was a really funny <clears throat> little moment where um, Monkey's like, "I encourage you not to die," and then licks her hand and then pats his the kubo's his hair, hair over <laughs> and then it just bounces back into place because it's uh you know a cartoon character and cartoon characters yeah. just always look the same it reminded me of like the paranorman thing where his hair never changes right through the whole movie um <clears throat> but yeah this is the point where they're out in the uh they're traveling through the snow uh kubo makes the origami birds and he's sort of just like playing with his powers at this point. This is another moment in a Leica movie where we see a bird in some way uh, expertly detailed and animated. And then Kubo is just pissing the bird off with <laughs> the bird is visibly angry. Yeah. He's being a little bit of a dick <laughs> at this a point. Bit of a dickhead. Yeah. And... I was like, please leave that bird alone. It's doing nothing except flying in the sky, living its life. And then he listens to you, but then he sends the bird up monkey's butt. Yeah. <laughs> monkey's pissed. And yeah. it's like, it's like these like mosquitoes like uh, around yeah. my head. And then they turn into mosquitoes by Mosquitoes accident. famously show up in like a, an Arctic desert, right? Yeah. Like that's where mosquitoes <laughs> are always at. Oh, yeah. That's very right. Much, very much like a kid attitude, you know? Like he yeah. finds his powers and what does he do? He's a little bit of a troublesome little butt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I thought this, it was so endearing because, uh, we get that glimpse of him not be able to control his powers because after he makes up that lie, like, Oh, mosquitoes, they turn into mosquitoes and actually, uh, uh, attack sort of 
There's only a couple of them, but it's sort yeah, of... Yeah, it's weird, because, like, <clears throat> I thought that this was going to be, you know, uh, showing us that he doesn't have full control of his powers, and then we would, you know, have other moments where it's either not obeying him or doing stuff it shouldn't be, or not helping him in time of need, but you don't or really get any more... the sequel where he loses his powers, because every superhero <laughs> loses their powers in the sequel for some reason. Right. When Kubo 2 and the two, <laughs> two more... <laughs> Kubo, Kubo and, and the two, two more... tubas. <laughs> no, Kubo and two more strings. <laughs> Kubo loses the two strings. Oh no! Where'd they go? <laughs> um, yes. So this is now when we get to meet Hanzo, but we call him Beetle. I guess we'll call him Beetle we'll call to him remove Beetle confusion. Yeah. So Kubo's showing off. He's like, look at me. There's no way I could possibly fall down this. Whoa! And falls down like a tunnel, like kind of a cave. Um, monkey jumps into action, goes down into the cave. It turns into sort of like a cool little labyrinth. Uh, hey. Yeah, I mean, this entire sequence, we've been seeing a, a shadowy figure following them um, stealthily. Mm -hmm. And it turns out to be a big bug man. Which yeah. Monkey does not want to invite into their crew. Monkey's no. like, no, thank you. <laughs> Some JRPG stuff where it's like, who the frig is this guy who could easily help us as the tank yeah. and the swordsman? And then he does this crazy little bow thing. Or and archer, like, yeah. Okay, cool. We and don't really like, have... Yeah, that's the first time I've ever done that. <laughs> like, whoa. Are cool. you sure? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, oh, another person I guessed that was Kyle McLaughlin. I thought it was Kyle McLaughlin briefly. Has sort of a... Because I've never heard... Matthew McConaughey do like a triumphant hero voice. He's always like, hey, I'm a sleazy sleaze from Sleazeville. I don't dream. Or no, what does he say? I don't sleep. I only dream. <laughs> okay. Weirdo. But yeah, you're right, Tatiana. He's a, tur I wrote Turbo Archer is his job class. Uh, Monkey is overly protecting because it is a protection token. I guess that was just a note that I made. That's when I realized because my brain operates at one mile an hour apparently uh <clears throat> and in this cave hanzo's pointing down the different hallways they make it to like this sort of this sort of chapel cave where there's like a pile of bones with a bunch they, of they go through a giant skull yeah, to get in there a skull, which is very zelda yeah. um this is when it becomes a D&D &D campaign. Where yeah. You're like, oh, this feels like D&D &D to me. My favorite gag of the whole movie happens here where Monkey's like, don't touch anything. And it cuts to them just like massaging the teeth. <laughs> yeah. Just like literally just touching it. They're both it. touching it, yeah. <laughs> they're not just like touching it like like foolish. No, they're rubbing. They're like, they're like what the is this? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Beetle pulls a tooth though. And he's like, I don't know. He's like, he did it. He points yeah. to him. It was him. <laughs> Uh, boss battle time. Um, Very cool and creative boss battle too. It's it's something that you know you've seen you've seen heroes fight giant things a million times, but having it be sort of a King Arthur moment and f immediately failure, and then they're like, no, you can't just pull the sword out of the stone hand. You have to pull the sword out of the skull of but the. But there's giant. so many swords. <laughs> yeah, but also there's like a hundred swords. You don't know which one is which. The moment I saw the skeleton hand, I'm like, that is attached to a skeleton body. It has to be. Um, so I was vindicated, which was nice. But then I was like, well, this just seems impossible now. He's like I... shooting arrows at a giant. Bone just, creature. Yeah. Like, what are like, they gonna no do? He's like completely nullifies piercing damage. There's none of that <laughs> happening here. Yeah, immunity. The, it also grabs monkey immediately, and as he's shooting the arrows, they're tinging off him and almost just hitting monkey. <laughs> yeah. She's like, enough with the <laughs> arrows stop. already. But it's not have to working. Figure this out. It's a yeah. very. Um, it reminded a me a lot of a Final Fantasy kind of a thing too, with all this with all the uh, swords sticking out of the head. And like you said, it's a puzzle. You got to figure out the right one. There's a lot of like, comedy, but it's like in a D and D jinx. campaign when you put a puzzle in and there's like, there is a failure state of the puzzle that will activate combat. Mm -hmm. It's like, they didn't even think no. to try and do the puzzle first. They're like, let's just immediately grab the sword, which is great because that is something that happens in D and D campaigns all the time. You'll meticulously make a puzzle for your, your campaign, uh, your players, and they'll just try and do like the, the the first thing that the knee jerk reaction or they'll they just be in. like let's go to the shop <laughs> but you think you'd learn you know you think you'd learn after that happens a couple times and you're burned but like sometimes you see the sword you're like well maybe we could just grab we it like maybe it it's yeah. fine 
But then I'm you like, get a paranoid group of people who are like, guys, we can't just pull it up. Remember what happened? Everything's a mimic. When the room started <laughs> filling up with molten metal. Yeah. Uh, and then it takes like an hour and a half and DM's just like, I didn't actually do any puzzle for this. Like you could just touch the sword, but I can't say anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess I should have ordered dinner. <laughs> yeah. And I do love that. Like when they're pulling out the other swords, they're just like the way they test it is they just immediately are smashing them and breaking them. It's, it is like the, the perfect example of just smash and grab in, you know, a puzzle scenario that you could have on screen and it's fun and it's cool. And like this, the shot where the hand goes up into the darkness is so ominous. And then the and eyes cool. glow. Yeah. Oh, very very well good. Done. Yeah. This, uh, what is it? The sort of unbreaking or the sort of, what's the sword called? The sort of, um, I think it's the unbreakable sword or yeah. something like that. And it's, it's he, I think it's just called sword unbreakable sword unbreakable. And he grabs it yeah. and he immediately breaks it. And I thought that was just like, so good because monkey's sure monkey's like, this is it. We just have to, you yeah. know, hamstring this thing with the sword unbreakable. And then we get the whole battle it has some good moments. Um, <clears throat> Kubo gets, goes up uh, and ends up falling. And then beetle archers him to a wall but he gets, he's like falling and he ends up falling on top of the skull. I'm not going to try to figure out the logistics. Yeah, we don't need to go beat for beat yeah. for this entire thing. <laughs> no, he gets just, the sword. I out just of the wanted skull. to mention that because it's all, the way this is animated is just so well done. Another one yeah. of those things where they didn't have to put this much into putting all this stuff in. I, I yeah. urge you to watch this movie and really look at <clears throat> all the things that are happening simultaneously because they would have had to like animate all of these things and then make them all cohesive together. I think that it is worthwhile to look up the making of this scene in particular because it is insane to watch because you've got, you know, four or five different animators moving this giant skeleton around with all these yeah. smaller um, figures moving around on it and it's 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 almost like an entire soundstage devoted to this one yep. creature with all these cameras around mm -hmm. and it it's mind-blowing especially when you see them doing it and then you know they'll give you they, they while filming this movie i guess they must have just had like a slow speed camera in the background taking a, a photo every you know minute or 20 minutes or so or whatever however long it takes to position position everything before you take another snapshot because it just shows these people moving around furiously at this high speed and the thing moving the way it is in the movie and you're like wow that that took them days and days and days to to just get a couple of frames did you notice the reference to indiana jones as well when he first goes to grab the sword he goes <laughs> yeah yep yeah, yeah great great stuff uh anyway they defeat the giant skeleton um and i wrote a lot of that out like by defeating it you mean they just finally found the right sword they find the right it sword out, and that which I, I did it. like as well because it just like it's almost like the sword was its power or whatever you, you pull the sword out and then the eyes Deactivate. go dead and then it just immediately it just falls, falls to pieces yeah. i remember what i was i forgot this element of it and this is how they get out but beetle right before all this like learns that he's got wings and can fly but he like poorly. So as they're falling, he sort of like reappears and takes them out. They go back out into the field. Did you notice the weird fart noise when they go out the eyeball? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. It, when they pop out of the eye, it's all this stuff comes out with it. And there's a very small like <laughs> noise, that, but it's like also compiled on top of a ton of other sound effects. But if you watch it with headphones on, you'll hear the noise. You'll hear it. I promise. Some sound designer was like, you know, it'd be funny. A it fart noise. Kids movie. They're getting farted out of an eye socket of a skull. <laughs> As is tradition. Yeah. The uh, they end up on a beach at this point, right? And <clears throat> monkey and beetle are sort of fighting over like what we're gonna do next. They're at the they're at the base of a of a lo of long river. You can't cross it because it's long or something or long lake. Called oh, the long lake. Long yeah. Lake. <clears throat> and uh, meanwhile, in the background, Kubo has learned, I guess at this point that he can make the, the leaves of the trees also act as like paper. And he builds this incredible ship. And uh, the leaf ship. It's the, cool as heck. It's, it's very so cool. cool. And it's, um, he, yeah, it's, it's kind of showing us that, not only can he manipulate paper into origami figures, he can also manipulate, even during the fight with the skeleton, he manipulates all the paper to act as sort of like a cloud of daggers around the skeleton's head, you know, blinding it. So he has all these different 
uh, aptitudes for his abilities that you don't even really consider until the movie starts to move forward. It feels like there's also a sense of his power growing. Yeah, right? he's getting like, stronger, especially yeah. yeah. when we get to the end, when he's deciding to fly back to the town, he's like at the peak of his power. And it's like exactly. all the all the banners are wrapping around him and they create these wings. And you're just like, oh, my God, this is like the end of Doctor Strange 2 when he uses all the ghosts as a cape or whatever. It feels like he's leveling up throughout the movie and we're just starting to see like more and more things that he can do, whether it's things that he never thought to do before, or if it's actually just that it's growing. So he's capable of doing more now. Yeah, it's almost like he thought that, you know, his power was only useful for, you know, sustaining him and his mom in the cave to be able to eat. He was using it to entertain people. But it's like, oh, yeah, you, you have a lot more uh, usage out of this ability than you think. And one of the, it is the ship. Is you can, go ahead. I was just going to say, because the ship is leaves, but underneath there's like sticks holding it together, too. Right? Yeah, it's like not it's... just uh, paper. It's like. I mean, I guess paper is made of wood. Maybe he can just maybe he's a wood maybe bender. Maybe it's a wood bender thing. <laughs> I think he's just. I think he is only limited by his imagination. That's. I think, at this point, he's learning what he's capable of. This is like that a, ship is so cool. It's a story the of ship... loss, comma <laughs> and imagination. Imagination. Yeah. Sorry, we're, little we're... Willy Wonka. No, I was just going to say the ship was amazing. Like I again, those fun little behind the scene things. I was seeing the construction of the ship and they had to have, I guess, like, I guess multiple versions because there's a point where it breaks down mm -hmm. um, and just how it breaks down in the water. So it's like you have this crazy leaf ship in addition to having stop motion water, which, again, unbelievable. Like, how do you do stop motion water? Like, how do you even do it? Is it like a sheet that's just kind of like <laughs> moving? Yeah. I think I've asked every week, every time that there's water, I'm going... But how? I but think how did they do this? Since you told us, Tatiana, the uh, the capes are that like mesh. It's a interlocked piano wire. The piano so, yeah, wire it's like thing. weaving piano wire. I think that I think that the ocean at the beginning of this movie, those giant waves, might have been something like that as well. Because that those the the big waves at the beginning of this movie, I've been. I've been miffed by since Steve made that opening video because that's the only that's all I knew about this movie <clears throat> is the little bits that he put in. And I've been saying for weeks that this thing's going to change my life. Spoilers, it kind of did. Kind of let it, it I, I was I was getting increasingly more nervous every time you would say that. I'm like I don't know, he might be disappointed by this. I at first <laughs> at first when I was trying to figure out what the movie was, I was a little bit like, "Oh no, Steve tried to warn me that I'm not going to be mind blown by this as hard." But I was because it, it it plays to exactly what I love. Like that was also me sort of trying to subvert trying to subvert your, my expectations. your expectations a little bit, which I appreciate you for, Steve. Yeah. Bring him um, down a little bit so that he can be just as excited as he was when he was originally yeah. looking at it. Because the only that times, sucks actually. The only yeah. times I've been a victim of overhype, especially with superhero movies and stuff. Mm -hmm. But since this thing is so like so special on its own. But but like I said, like how did they create those giant waves at the beginning? But there are parts in like Missing Link where there's literal water, but it doesn't move like water. It's almost like a like a clay or like a clear plastic or something that they're just. Moving yeah, and in there such there are way. definitely moments in all these movies where there is CGI that is implemented in order to do things that would be impossible to do. Right, like we're talking about the snow and stuff, which is not a knock at the movie. It's just you can't do it. Like how would you do yeah. it? Um, also, like the rainstorm, as we we will eventually, we're close to getting to that scene with the ship in the rain. But like yeah. rain and stop motion would be so difficult, even yeah. if you're CGIing the rain. Like to do the effect of rain throughout the fight scene is. They just take 100 years to make this movie by dropping <laughs> each individual. <laughs> I just realized also, I'm sort of I sort of have the same background as the Kubo poster. No, oh, yeah, oh yeah, you are you are Kubo. You are essentially Kubo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Or the sun um, instead of the moon. Oh, the sun power. There's probably some story in the Kubo world of the sun god and they're like her mother of the sun or whatever. And she's not an evil prick. She's like, everybody have eyes. <laughs> <laughs> have too many, many eyes. eyes yeah. If you want. <laughs> yeah. The uh, the we get a really heartwarming sort of family moment right before like like a scene bef a couple scenes before they realize they're a family, but they they need to eat. Monkey's like, we're on an ocean. There are fish. Uh, Beetle's like, I'm a crack uh, archer. And he shoots a fish, or, or sorry, he teaches Kubo, who picks it up immediately, how to, you know, archer a fish. 
and they're Kubo and Beetle are like miffed. They shoot the fish. The fish sinks. Monkey's like, "Are you guys dumb? Think about it. I got all this rope." They make like a like like a fishing lure sort of situation with the bow. So you just shoot the arrow. They catch some fish. They make some nice sushi. It's a great little family moment that you only realize is a family moment on a rewatch because at that point it's just like three misfit weirdos on a boat created by magic yeah. this is also when the the two of them the monkey and the beetle start to act like a like they're flirt flirtatious with each other yeah. and you it's like there's some sort of history there so th- this is when you start to realize like oh there's more to this than just but i also picture. made an I, I made a note here not really grasping the fact that this like father son and or father mother son and it was giving a little bit of uh alice in wonderland sort of vibes at this point but when you know on a rewatch what it is it's nothing like alice in wonderland like sure it's like a a hero's adventure sort of thing where you you know you get some cast members in your party but really it's more of a family story than um alice in wonderland and i know or uh Wizard of Oz. I wrote Alice in Wonderland. But I meant to write Wizard of Oz, and I know nice. Wizard. I know Wizard of Oz is technically her family members in a sort of a way because it's like a dream world. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, my, I think my the comparison whole brain is fair. chemistry just changed when I realized that I meant to write Wizard of Oz, and it's all right. We forgive you, Jason. Still Wizard Good of God. Oz. We know what your point is. <laughs> I'm gonna just keep saying words till Steve is finally driven insane uh, yeah okay okay we get it you met I wizard find, of Oz. i find it very funny to watch the um the monkey flirt with beetle just because specifically the monkey's face with the flirtations is just so good like the way they get the facial expressions it just feels almost wrong because you're like a monkey and a beetle like <laughs> love is love but Which I'm she's confused. kind of into it <laughs> when he's saying yeah. some dumb nonsense and she's like yeah i feel you Tatiana's like, listen, you can love who you want. I just don't want them to get married. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, I'm like, logistically, I don't understand monkey right off. It's Adam people. and Eve, not monkey yeah. and beetle. Okay. <laughs> well, this is like the, I guess, again, the, like the power of the magic, right? And, and the magic being their love for one another, right? It's mm-hmm. unbreakable, even though they don't know who, who one another is. There's still they, that connection. There is a bond. And, you know, there was a bond when we get, get a little bit further and we hear the story of how monkey met uh, Hanzo to begin with and how they fell in love. Uh, you, you sort of understand that that connection exists on a deeper level and you almost feel like given if, if you were to give them enough time with one another, monkey and beetle, they would fall in love again. Right. Like mm-hmm. that's kind of, it's like, it's meant to be like they, they are soulmates and uh, and it's cute and it's nice and it feels good, <laughs> you know, to, to realize that, no matter how many memories are stolen from them, they they will still find a way to uh, to come together. To find each other. To find each other. And Kubo is the string attaching them all together. It's great. The third string. String theory. <laughs> yeah, that's my string theory for today. <laughs> so one of the uh, one of the sisters catches up. <clears throat> um with a sick weapon. With a sick yeah. weapon. Beetle. That's actually the weapon that I was going to be using in the exalted campaign you know it's so funny um so is cassandra oh shit i guess i'll have to change <laughs> maybe <mine. laughs> maybe you'll have to you'll have to discuss yeah <laughs> i already drew my character did cassandra <laughs> you Friend just, of the show cast you draw you just yeah. draw cast with a different weapon so yeah that's your weapon. <laughs> use a bow yeah. staff so yeah, yeah. sorry <laughs> just really convince her to do magic she knows she wants to also i'm not married to that to that weapon and i didn't even realize that it was probably this movie that made me want to use those weapons as a character it is it's a such a cool weapon, weapon. it's yeah. like you have that length it's it looks like a chain like a scythe. climbing pick <clears throat> it looks like yeah. a scythe yeah. yeah well that was the whole reason behind it is i wanted to have two of them and they look like little scythes and my character like considers himself death and he's like that's the reason he chose them is like i'm like death but littler <laughs> and i have two scythes instead of one um uh, be- why did beetle go underwater i like missed he this. decided that he had to go down and get the armor okay and then he forgot why he was down there and right he and came back a with fish. a fish later <laughs> so kubo, the fish that kubo shot earlier he's like hey i found the fish <laughs> so while monkey's fighting the sister kubo goes down to to find beetle they immediately find the armor which i thought was a really cool like they don't have to like get to the 
the, they get to the point instead of like a whole thing, which I like because the first one was like they went through a dungeon and, and found the boss. But this time it's a little bit different. It's more psychological. There's this crazy battle happening. The ship is being destroyed by Monkey and the sister battling. Um, <clears throat> Beetle's gone. And this th these eyes start appearing. These crazy eyes. And they're showing Kubo sort of images. The movie goes into horror movie again. <laughs> horror movie again. Yeah. And it's sort of through this is teaching Kubo though that Monkey is his mom, which is interesting. But you're also learning that upstairs during the fight, it's like this coinciding revelation that Monkey is having about herself that she is Kubo's mother, and Kubo is also learning that Monkey is her is his mother at the same time. And it's so good. It's it's, it's so such good. it's such a, it's a, it's a, like a really good storytelling device that. You know, it could have been just as satisfying to have one of those two things happen, but having them happen at the same time is it's a little bit more powerful. And it also makes it more clear, right? Because we do know that Monkey was created by Kubo's mom, but we don't know that Monkey is Kubo's mom. I mean, it's hinted at, I guess, here and there, but we don't know for sure. And even the way that the eyeball reveals it, it's still not fully clear. It's just showing those three things connected to each other in some capacity, right? But Kubo understands it, and then it's made even more clear in a cool way too. It's not like a Darth Vadery. No, you are Kubo's father, or whatever. It's like she has the re revelation rather than it being revealed to her via the sister or something. You know, like, don't you realize? I wrote a Darth Vadery thing for like when he meets the grandfather later because that's it's a little bit that too. But at this point, I thought it was very interesting that like this monster uses um, like it hypnotizes you and pulls you into its like horrible mouth. And the funny yeah. thing is, is I was using those moments of it just showing the mouth to like take a quick note because I was trying to like take notes. So I didn't really get the full gravity of like that mouth. I saw glimpses of it while I was like looking down and trying to like keep an eye on both. But when I watched it again today, I was fully like, I was engaged, man. Though that that mouth, you were hypnotized. So, you were I falling into the mouth. Yeah. yeah, it was so good. <clears throat> I love a, I love that trope of like being hypnotized by a monster and getting sucked into its its gaze like a succubus or like the the uh in ghostbusters 2 vigo of carpathia the the painting like i love that horror trope of like the siren song you know the sirens mm -hmm. um i love that i think i thought it was very well done is the siren the siren um <clears throat> thing is good too because it's also a like an ocean creature which uh, this thing, this monster, though, was like a, I don't know, like a creature from the seventh dimension. Yeah, it's like a Lovecraft like a monster. Lovecraft I was going to say super eldritch horror kind of. Yeah, like yeah. an eldritch horror. The, All the uh, eyeballs. Yeah, yeah, Gorath or whatever. Yeah. Cthulhu. Cthulhu. The puppets were made from um, bingo, you know, like the bingo tumbler, like size balls. So they were huge, huge. Eyeballs. Yeah, I was reading that the, <laughs> that, that was also one of the, like the largest um, models that like has ever made was this Cthulhu monster. <clears throat> With Which the is... crazy teeth, like so many sets of teeth. They yeah. look so sharp. <laughs> yeah, it looks like something out of a junkyard. Yeah, it was awesome. shredding cars. It, um, uh, I, I did want to like add, this is also kind of what you were saying earlier about the action sequence with the skeleton, but the action sequences in this movie, particularly the one with Monkey and the, uh, the one of the fight sisters, choreography in this sequence, I didn't really mention it, but it's so fucking good. Like it's. Well, I wasn't even just going to say that it's good because it is. We already know this. It's, it's fucking amazing. It's like the best sequence in the movie. But the way they pace it and the way that everything is so deliberate, it's quick and it's exciting, but it's also like so deliberate and so well paced that you don't miss anything that's happening. Yeah. You know, one of the, one of the issues with like transformers, as we were talking about earlier, or Marvel movies is that there's so much junk happening on screen that you, you can't really absorb it. Or transformers digest it. is especially bad for that. Yeah. Um, you can't digest what you're seeing. Whereas this, everything is framed so deliberately that every single moment of this action sequence sequence is processed, but it also feels exciting and fast paced but it's not so fast paced and so junky that you don't really kind of get what's happening. And what's important is it's a massive exposition dump to the plot. This whole, this whole scene is a massive exposition dump to explain so many things that it doesn't feel like it's happening to you. But after on the other side of this whole sequence, 
you have all this extra information that you didn't have before, but it was given to you in an entertaining way that didn't feel like two people talking and just like, Oh, remember the time when this happened? Well, the reason for this is this. And then it, that's how it's explained. This is like a really exciting fight and a horrible nightmare <clears throat> happening. Literally, like you said, upstairs and downstairs, you know? Yeah. Like I cannot get over this whole movie and the way that it does storytelling. I think that future um, students of film directors could learn a lot from this style of storytelling. And then on top of that, current director or current, (laughs) but then on top of that, it's stop motion. So it's like they could have done one or the other, but they did both and made this masterpiece. Steve, I was going to ask you, uh, usually we talk about this during the director segment, but do you have like some numbers (laughs) for this movie? Do you know how much it cost and how much it made? I do. Um, it unfortunately did not make as much as it should have, but it, it was budgeted at sixty million and it made seventy seven point five million. So not great, but they, uh, but they made this for sixty million, and the last like four <laughs> Marvel movies were hundred million dollar flops. Yeah, yeah, and but I mean, for some reason, this movie didn't catch the numbers that Paranorman and Coraline did. And unfortunately missing link did even worse than this. Um, Maybe the next one will do better. Who knows? I think this movie, what it had going for it, that something like the missing link doesn't is the character design is so fun. Whereas in the missing link, there's only really one fun character design and that's the Yeti himself or the, the Bigfoot himself. Everyone else is just kind of whatever. Uh, this movie, every character is fun. <laughs> you know, they're all cool. They're all fun. Beetle is amazing with his four arms and just to the structure of him and all the funny things that he can do. It's very toyetic, right? You can make these things into toys and people will want to buy them. Um, his but, puppet looks like a giant action figure. So, yeah. <laughs> but even like, you know, the sisters, the, mm-hmm. the, the monster at the end, all of these things would be amazing toys uh, or statuettes or whatever. Um and I think that's something that the missing link didn't have going for it, but also it still didn't, it wasn't enough to bring in, you know, the, the numbers that we want to see in 2016. So I was actually looking because I know this movie got nominated um, for quite a few, actually, I think all the awards for the animated movie. Yeah. Including best 2016. Picture, yeah. But I yeah. realized that what it lost to the most was usually Zootopia. So that came out the same year. And I think Zootopia was also, um, a very kid-friendly movie that mm-hmm. dealt with, like, you know, a lot of things about, like, racism and different things like that. So I think maybe there was some attention really heavily on, I think it's Pixar, right, Zootopia? I think, I think it was Disney. Yeah. But, I mean, Disney, Disney yeah. and Pixar are the same now at this point. Yeah, so I think, I don't know if maybe there was, like, a sense of overshadowing in terms of, like, what people maybe were more interested in seeing. Definitely. I think that Zootopia, in, like you were saying, what its themes were dealing with was, especially at that time, far more important you know, the themes in this movie, though they're very good, it's not dealing with something on a societal level, but it's like, you know, it's still an amazing story and it's a beautiful story. <clears throat> I personally like this movie better than Zootopia, but I mean, I mean Zootopia is fine. You know, it's <laughs> tough. I love Zootopia. I think it's a wonderful movie, but I, I will say now after watching this, I like this one much better, but I think it's because it's it feels a little more adult. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and Which Zootopia strange. didn't make me weep. Yeah. Into my microphone. No, but I did listen to that Shakira song for like a whole year. <laughs> <laughs> um, the end of this battle is fantastic. The when like there's a bit there's like a back and forth between the two. Um, the sister gets her claw into monkey in this in this bit. Um, monkey's monkey's trying to, wounded. M- monkey's wounded. Monkey's trying to go for the sword. Monkey. Uh, like I monkey guess, see monkey do monkey see monkey do <laughs> monkey gets the sword I suppose because uh, one of the best shots of the movie is the mask cut in half flowing yeah. down underwater I thought that was it's really such a well good way done. to uh, evoke violence mm-hmm. without actually showing violence like to because your imagination is like oh her head got cut in half probably but I thought her whole she... body got cut in half that's how right, I yeah. that's how I read it that's an unbreakable sword you can run that right through a person exactly yeah. <laughs> Which is like, you know, these movies, they have some sort of like some heightened violence that you don't really see too much in other movies. Um, But 
they find creative ways to have you be like, oh man, that's brutal, but without actually showing anything brutal. It's very, I, think... I was just saying, it's very like an like kids anime way to do it. Like Avatar where you don't style. really have any blood. I think yeah. that's the secret. If there's no blood, there's not really. It's just like there's a no violence. Of violence. You know what? What I like, I always say, if there's no blood, there's no crime. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ! And I think it's just like how messed up your brain is from other things you watch that you fill in what oh, yeah, actually course, occurred. Yeah. So if somebody that says a whole body cut in half. Stephen yeah. thinks it's just the head. Yeah, I thought it was just her head got cut now. I thought it was just this her wise. mask. Yeah. So this really... wise. <laughs> I thought she just cut her mask off and she was fine. <laughs> um, yeah. Monkey Matt Hanzo is the next note that I wrote. Tells a story about the night they met. Monkey's mother, you are my quest. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the story about <clears throat> so monkey like remembers everything now at this point is that is that what i am yeah she's telling the story because she now remembers she's kubo's mother so she's explaining how she met her father Um, oh i must have meant this is the story of how monkey Mm -hmm. met hanzo in the first place a beautiful story she's like sent there to like take him out yeah yeah and it's three of them it's in oregon they're triplets right right? i assume i'm assuming they're triplets Yeah. yeah Or um, she's the older sister, and they're both like middle younger. Right, or older and wiser. Um, she is, yeah. It is origami, but it's made out of flowers instead of right, uh, yeah, instead of paper. <laughs> but uh, the story is basically that, yeah, the three of them were sent to kill Hanzo. Hanzo being on the quest to find all the artifacts to kill Hanzo is moon, Link the, from the, the Legend Father. of Zelda. Yeah, <laughs> he's old man Link, and uh, they have a fight the two of them, the mother and father of Kubo in which uh, Hanzo, you know, he, his quest is to find these items. But during the fight, he realizes like, Oh, this, the quest isn't to find these items. You are in fact, the, the quest has led me to you. And now you are my quest, which you could consider problematic, I suppose. But I think if you think about it as him sacrificing his quest for something else that he now cares for like a quest doesn't mean, in the context of this movie, I like think to, conquer. Yeah, I don't mm-hmm. think it means to like to obtain a trophy. I think it means like his ongoing quest in life is to like make this other person happy. Um, if also, you look at it I'm, that way, it's not, it's not problematic. I suppose. Also, I think it's like it's what very incel. Bombs. And he was like, "Hey, I like this," so then maybe yeah. it's okay. But I'm also such a sucker for a callback to a line like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So damn, if that didn't also make me cry. <laughs> yeah, and and you know it's it's underlined later when Monkey is dying and he he realizes who he is and he's like, "You are my quest." And it's like, "My quest is to protect you and make you happy and, and love you." Like, that's very nice. And it's my also quest is that I'm such that a point. nice guy, milady, that you are my quest. <laughs> That's a joke. Jesus Christ. <laughs> that you proposed to your wife? Yep. <laughs> At the Grand Canyon, I said, listen, Madison, you're my listen, quest. Listen, lady, lady. You're my quest. You're my quest. Yeah. You really can't say no. no. So let's do this. Also, you're on the edge of a canyon right now. So. <laughs> yeah. so you have to say yes. Some of that is true. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you decipher what. Um, but yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I think that there there are different ways to read it, and obviously, like you can you can put your own stamp on it. On I, what you I read, read from it as it, but... like they fell like they kind of they battled, they met wits, they fell in love, and um, it was just sort of a like a nice thing, you know, like a poetic thing to say. Yeah, like, maybe she was paraphrasing. There yeah, was actually like, like four four to five months of dating after the fight. Yeah, where they both realized they no, were into each other. No, this is a story. Yeah, it's, it's like, like mythical. Story. It's also like a mythical story. Yeah. That doesn't happen over four or five months. That is instant, right? It like happens immediately. Fight, yeah. fight, he knocks off her mask. He's like, wow, you're actually beautiful. And then yeah. bam, but she's like bing, really boom. impressed with his like skill at fighting her she was but really also she her. says that like she saw this like compassion and warmth in his eyes that she'd never seen before which you know we know in the story that they're not supposed to be able to feel that and she, mm-hmm. it's like the first time she ever felt anything from looking into somebody's eyes before so that's how you know it was magic that's how you know but the grandfather found them and uh <clears> that she had to escape with kubo after the grandfather plucks out one of his eyes because he wants to make kubo like him blind to humanity moon king is an evil nazi mm. 
That's my hypothesis. Okay. We're going to have to bleep that word every you time can you say, say it. You can say Nazi, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I think. Also, Kubo cannot see because he's missing Uh-oh. an eye. <laughs> Uh-oh, hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm so interested. Like, what did they do with the eye? Like is there this like is it ground into dust? Is it like a mm-hmm. he, he snorts it? Like, he grinds into like dust and does and fucking does a fucking party rail, a kubo rail. Does he eat the eye? Maybe just yeah. It's him. they don't really explain. I, I at first I thought that he wanted his eyes to like put into something like in Coraline yeah. or whatever, right? But then it's like no, he just wants to take his eyes. He, it's it's almost like he just takes them and hucks them away or something. Again, you know, like just it. to blind him. Honestly, yeah. I only have seen the two, so I've only seen Coraline and Kubo, and I was like, like clearly, there's an obsession with eyeballs. <laughs> eyeballs yeah. and mothers. And moms and, and eyes. Those, yeah. those are the two. The <laughs> other two Leica movies that we did don't have too much... I don't think they have any eyeball stuff. No eye stuff. Yeah. Well, you know, the I mean, Paranorman can weird. see yeah, ghosts. Can see ghosts. <laughs> That's his whole deal. But they don't take anyone's eyes. Um, also, Henry Selleck is just obsessed with eyeball stuff. He's, he always has weird eyeball stuff going on in his movies. Um, yeah. So anyway, let's move so on. So that shall night, we? <laughs> Kubo has a little dream about an old blind man. Um, we finally get to meet Ray, Ralph Fiennes. He's like, obviously, his grandfather. That this was where I was like, okay, stop fooling me, movie. I know now because I was fooled too many times. You're not going to fool me again. Um, and he basically is like, you have to claim the helmet, and you have to claim your kingdom. And uh, I wrote, I think that was the Moon King. Thanks, past me. The vent, uh, they venture on, and everything, everything seems good. Did you guys notice how like comically good everything feels in this next little sequence of them traveling? Of just like everything, they're joking around. You know, the mom and the dad are flirting. The 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 son has his parents back. You know. Well, we do have the one moment that Monkey is realizing like she's gonna be gone soon, and Hanzo then says, you know, like I'll take care of him when you're gone. Don't yeah. worry, and like your memory is gonna live on for you know forever as long as people are telling your story. Uh, you won't die, and Kubo will remember you. My next note is: I hope a bunch of horrible stuff doesn't happen. <laughs> And of course but I think the reason that everything is so jovial at, up to this is because we're we're about to hit that horrifying moment, and so you want everybody to feel good so that you can tear them down to the point that they are going to cry. Yeah, um, I think they're like right, like Kubo's riding high on the fact that like he still has his mom right now, right, in whatever yeah. form that is. And Monkey is now, you know, realizing that she has to be. She she now knows she's mom as well, so there there's this nicety going on there. But then she also realizes that she's going to go. So she has to, you know, give Kubo at least a little bit of time of happiness with her. And Hanzo is now revealed to be, you know, like Kubo's protector. So now she she has no reason to be a, a jerk to him anymore. So happy they, family. They, tra- they, they travel up to like into sort of a town <clears throat> where we get a shot of the spider insignia that is on, you know, Kubo's jacket, uh, Kubo's uh, robe, who was, of course, Hanzo's robe previously which we learned earlier in the movie um and they get to this they get to this building and painted on the front of the building um is a picture of a of of his mom and i guess his hanzo who is his dad now this is where i started to put everything together like really like i know it seems dumb now in retrospect but watching this for the first time i was like ready to get swerved by everything so it was a really big revelation for me to see that and realize at that moment that Hanzo is the dad in, you know, I guess ghost form until we find out what he actually is in a few minutes. Um, and throughout the house, they find pictures of the monsters and pictures of the family. And I wrote, Beetle is Hanzo, isn't he? <laughs> that's why Monkey Wait a and Beetle are fruity. <laughs> that's an exa- that's uh, at the moment note that I wrote down. Um, and the other sister arrives at this point. They go into the, uh, the little, the little it courtyard. A... Yeah, it was a trap. Yeah, it was a trap. Um, set by Grandpapa Moon Man. The Moon Boy. The Moon Man. Why, why would he trust his dream grandfather? You feel like he'd be like, Mm-mm, seems like bad news. 
Yeah, Kubo is a little bit too naive at this point, but I, you know. He's also a child. We have to sometimes he's, remember. Yeah, he is. <laughs> he's like a little kid. Um, and he's he's got his armor and his sword. He's feeling good. Maybe he suspected it was a trap of, of, of some sort and that he would have to deal with something, and but he would still get the helmet. Nope. Nope. Ralph Fiennes is not a good man. No, Ralph Fiennes always plays a Voldemort in everything he plays. <laughs> uh, the the They fight the sister. The sister actually ends up killing Monkey and Beetle. It's another great fight, but it's we can kind of just like gloss over it because it's just a well-done fight that ends in the demise of Monkey and Beetle, which really well, sucks. All, this is where we also get the, the revelation that uh, Beetle is Hanzo. And it's, the yeah. sister is the one that tells them kind of yeah. in a scoffing way. Yeah, like a classic movie villain. She reveals that like, oh, right? you idiots. You didn't even figure it out yet. You guys have been traveling together as a family and you don't even know. And she, How delicious. She, yeah, she just like loves to. <laughs> she, and she And she knows she's about to kill them. So she's taking even more time to. She like, you know, makes takes the little Hanzo and scrunches him up and like with telekinetic power, I guess, and then reforms him into a beetle to be like, yeah, we took you, we took out all your memories and we turned you into a monster. I do you like that Hanzo and Hanzo's like, what the heck? What the heck are you talking I didn't know. About? I didn't know. Fucking just got I stabbed was... in the back for his, uh, for his problem. We his got trouble. the voice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I didn't realize that was a beetle. <laughs> so Kubo does unleash a huge attack on the sister and gets her um, and the origami with the origami Hanzo's final dying breath points to the location of the helmet and gathers his gear and now as Kubo's leaving to go get the helmet um, so in a lesser movie like a DreamWorks animation movie this is the point where he would look at that and then it would like transform into the town and then we get a montage of every time you saw the helmet because yeah, those kind of movies don't trust their audience yeah. to put shit together. You know, but like, instead, do you know what we get? Do you know what we get instead? That's when they said the name of the movie in the movie. Sort of. Again, sort of. When he puts the other string on his arm, I went, and the two strings! <laughs> oh my god, there's two of them there! Uh, yeah, he, he picks up the 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 draw from the bow <clears throat> like the string from the bow and mm -hmm. ties that he's got the two his two strings picks up like his broken uh what's the guitar's name again shamison. the shamison picks up it's the shamison got one string left he's got one string left uh, not even no it has one left it does oh yeah yeah that's um, him right. the other two strings are broken because his parents are dead those are the two dead strings Kubo and the two dead strings. He got them back, like knowingly had them back for like all of 40 seconds. Yeah, yeah it's crushing. And your man. heart breaks for this boy. While he's saying like, he's like, father, and he's like, my son. And then he gets stabbed in the back, like while he's having a dad oh. speech. Yeah, it's crazy. But uh, which is a, which was a very heavy moment for me because you're right. But in retrospect, if you look at it, if you think about it, like he had all that time with them. You know, so at least, yeah, but you know, I mean, but he, I think he's it's that just realization. Yeah, right? it's like he's processing it while he's processing that this beetle man is his dad. The beetle man dies. It's like oh, while his mom is dying too. He's it's like need... that moment of happiness, and then just it's taken away. So yeah. it's like all that possibility gone. He's gonna need to find a good therapist, I think, to really compartmentalize. Yeah. Oh wait, this. Kubo destroys uses the two strings to kill the ant. Yeah, like blows her into bits or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's when he said the name of the movie in the movie himself. Yeah. He levels up again. <laughs> he levels and up now again. He can just disintegrate people with. His <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he flies off back to his hometown, where the helmet was the bell that rang every night. And I wrote, "Fuck, that's good storytelling." Uh, the townspeople are still there, and he tells Hiding them to go hide the rubble. even yeah. further. Um, he has all the parts and summons the Moon King. It was the dream man after all. Uh, Force Ghost Moon King tries to Darth Vader bring him to the moon side. Was a note that I wrote. All right, like that, yeah. Steve. Uh, they do a battle and it's insane. Join uh, me, give me your eye. Give me your eye. We could rule, the, we could rule we the, moon the moon as world. grandfather and grandson. Um, he gets blasted back, uh, but with his like sort of final final moments, he restrings the guitar with the two strings and his and own hair. Yes. He summons all the dead 
and casts a protection spell. Uh, I think that, it would be more appropriate to say he summons all of the loved ones of the villagers. The <laughs> right, he doesn't. Of, yeah. Okay, he summons a bunch of the army of the dead. <laughs> yeah. He summons all of the ghosts of the loved ones of the village who had been almost sent. Now, this is a moment where I noticed that, or I, I recognized that they didn't fully send their loved ones on during that um, festival because back then, as they're going down the river, when the sisters appear, all of those lights go out. So I thought that was a cool little touch, which I didn't really notice till the second time through as well. The best part about all of this is through this sequence, this is where we're getting the like giant evil koi um, carapace having worm ghost monster. Right. Bit. All of those things. Yeah. All of those things. The uh, moon king. The moon king. <laughs> the yeah. moon king. And uh, basically they use their power of love to like to like blast the moon king out of his monster self back into reality well i mean what it seems like is he's using the power of the memory because i thought the theme throughout is like memories are the most powerful type of magic he's using the memories of all these loved ones as like a purifying energy that essentially I guess like nullifies the moon man's memories in some way, but it, it like takes away all his moon power, which is why I read the moon being a sliver at the end as like a crescent moon. All of that other energy is gone. It's been swept, swept away by the memories of these loved ones. And Kubo gives him like a tiny sliver of what he had in order to not die. He also gives him one eye. Yeah. The power of sight. So I think it's, he's given him one eye. Which I'm like, is that Kubo's eye that he got taken away? Maybe he gave him Kubo's own eye so that he could see into people's souls and have some compassion and empathy for love, love just have love for human, humanity where there was none before. And then the entire town gaslights him into being a good guy. <laughs> well, that's what it's going to say. I, I kind of t- looked at it as kind of like they took away, he took away a chunk of his memory. That's absolutely true. And that's not the nicest thing to do to someone. Um, and then as a town guest, yes, gaslights, they're trying to fill it in as being like, hey, if we can convince you you're a good person, maybe you'll be maybe a good person. Yeah. But that's the most unique defeating a, a, a monster overlord final boss I've, I've ever seen. It reminded me a lot of like <clears throat> in the game Earthbound um, at the very end of the game. So in Earthbound, you put your own name into the game. It's like this prompt comes up about halfway through. It's like, what's your name, the player? At the very end of the game, it starts to talk to you while you're fighting the final boss. And it's like, now ask the the townspeople how they feel. Do they have the power of love? And this reminded me of that. It's like they used the power of love from the people of the town to all get together and use their love power to not just not kill this guy and turn him into dust or turn him into a double force ghost or whatever. But instead, they wiped his memory of the evil and replaced it because Kubo, it's like a redemption thing. <clears throat> Everybody gets redeemed in this story, you know. Not Every- the sisters. Yeah, they get killed. The sisters <laughs> fucking get cut in half. But they got they're, killed. They're pure. Evil. And sliced them too. That's actually a really good point. Like, why did they? Right. Like, why man? kill the sisters if you're not gonna kill the moon god? That was my only gripe with this. I was just like, that's why we need a really- prequel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> If you're why willing is this guy to worth kill saving? the sisters, why why not kill the big bad that probably shaped his children to be this way? To be evil, <laughs> but also like if you think about it, they stole all of the memories from Hanzo, and he still managed to be who he was meant to be in the end. So it's like, is grandpa gonna remember stuff or just be naturally evil? Like they're all being like, you are the nicest person in the village, and you go around giving people bread and money, and he's like. Really? Really? <laughs> you taught my children how to swim, and he's like, "I don't think I would do that." That seems like weird one, because I have a one year down the road. He's like taking eyeballs out of people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that exactly. seems weird because I have a latent hunger for eyeballs. Yeah, and, and I also prefer drowning children to <laughs> teaching them how to swim. Uh, it kind any... of. Sorry, I was just gonna say it kind of reminds me. Also, um, I'm rewatching the Avatar: Last Airbender. And just like at the end as well, where Aang is just kind of in a situation where like everyone is telling him he has to kill. He has to kill this person. He has to kill this person. He has to kill this person. And he's like to his core, he's like, no, there has to be a better way. Um, so I don't know. Maybe Kubo's just like, there's been enough death. Hmm. I have lost 
all of my family except you. Yeah. As bad as you are, can I make you better? You just flooded back Avatar for me. I, I haven't seen that since it was like on, but I loved Avatar. I'm rewatching it. I can't help myself. I've been sick. I've watched all three seasons. <laughs> really? Are you watching yeah, it so you can like... Avatar. I, I've I didn't been watch... speaking through most of it and okay. then having to go back a lot. So <laughs> I'm doing that with Curb Your Enthusiasm right now, where it's just kind of on in my house all oh, the yeah, time. It's a very comparable show to Avatar. Yeah, they're the same yeah. show. Larry David's like, ah, ah. Larry David is uh, the Avatar. He's got the arrow on his head. <laughs> all four elements of comedy. Yeah. <laughs> Racism. <laughs> That's, That's the only one. Yeah. <laughs> He's a racism um, bender. Anyway, so like, I, I was also wondering if, he didn't mean to spare him and because it seems like he's surprised and kind of you know like Not he was revolted. ready to fucking sort of yeah, the, it, the power of the healing town was like no we'll bring him in but i mean maybe it's like that power because it's coming from a, a sense of pure goodness and love and memory is like you can't kill somebody with that, but you can remove all of the negative energy and, and anger and malice that is in a person and just take it away nullify it and if that's the case cool but then kubo does also agree to you know tell him the story of his life up until that point because he's essentially lost all his memories and you're like okay so Kubo's gonna maybe he'll tell him the truth who knows right like we he could be like before this you were a despicable horrible monster and we you have the chance to change that's that's interesting to me i don't know if like lying to him <laughs> he was the great idea have you ever played a video game where that happens to your character and you mm -hmm. find out it's usually never great um, oh quick side note uh the gory details are rating us right now with seven raiders hello and welcome i guess we missed it because uh we oh. still, it's still showing five people watching but uh sorry i didn't mean to cut you off Oh, what, hello, degrees. hello, the gory details. Look, we're getting the chats lighten up. Whoa. Whoa, we got um, 10 viewers in the house. How's everybody doing? And then we get another George Takei line, finally. <laughs> or Takei, is it Takei? Did George I say it wrong? Yeah. Uh, after, you know, almost 50 minutes of him not saying anything, you're like, finally, he's back. Um, and then we the movie ends with, you know, not as happy an ending as you would expect from a children's movie. You know, it's, it's still pretty leak um you get his parents as force ghosts, as force ghosts. <laughs> yeah another star wars connection with the lanterns being pushed again you're just yeah. kind of like oh again sobbed i was like no it's not fair he deserves his parents i just yeah i mean you are kind of tearing up with the excitement and the the overwhelmingness of like him agreeing to to reinstate his his grandfather's memories or retell them i guess with with a sweet origami show i assume <laughs> Um, and you're already kind of like on the edge of tears at that point, And then you get this ending and you're not crying for the same reason you would be crying at the end of a Disney movie, for example, where everything is so happy. It's like still sort of tragic. So and you're like, man, I have this thing when I listen to like classical music, like if I'm in a live orchestra, um, I'll just get this like overwhelming, like my eyes get like, it's not it. The, the, the ending of this movie had a different kind of cries at the same time. Obviously it's sad and happy, but also the intensity got me really hard. And I, I like the movie, the credits were rolling and I was just letting myself cry, not like trying to stifle it or like, I, I don't need to, you know what I mean? I don't need to cry right now. I was like, yeah. I'm letting this happen because Jason I was thinking, puts on the Mulan soundtrack. <laughs> be a man. Be a man. I was thinking of, uh, I was my my grandmother passed away in 2020 during like right at the beginning of COVID. It couldn't process it properly because of COVID. Then my grandfather passed away last year and that had a weird, like, tinge to it because the, there was a bunch of family stuff around it so i couldn't really process that properly and i think this movie being such, such a story of loss and such a story of like reconciling your own feelings towards loss i had a real like moment like authentic moment when when they sort of are standing together and he sends them off and he says you know da 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 and that's the story of you know kubo and the two strings and he goes the end that fucked me up. That fucking broke my brain. Frisian. That's right, Gory Details. I had Frisian. And you're absolutely right. I get Frisian from Final Fantasy music exclusively. 
and Chrono Trigger music and also Earthbound, as I mentioned previously. Um, well, that's music is supposed to do that to you. So I got frizzed. Not, I got frizzed up, frizz. as the kids say. <laughs> Is that a play on Riz? Yeah, yeah, I'm it's still learning. On... You're dripped in frizz. <laughs> I'm dripping with frizz. <laughs> <laughs> I frizzed my pants. Nope. I bricked up with frizz. <laughs> I bricked up with frizz. Uh, thank you for reminding me of the word frisson. I uh... And then the credits, of course, has the Regina Spectre version of As My Guitar Gently Weeps. And I was able to gently weep <laughs> as the credits yeah. rolled. But during that, these credits... They put that song in there so that everybody felt okay about how much they were crying at the end of the song. <laughs> you can cry to Regina Spectre. I have. One time I, I saw it in drowned. 4D, and instead of spraying water at you at the end, they sprayed a bunch of tissues. <laughs> Here, take these. <laughs> take, You'll need clean them. yourself <laughs> up. Yeah. And get and out. Then, but then the credits have like the making of so many of these like puppets. So what a cool yeah. way. So you're crying, but then you're like, this is like, really oh, cool. This is so interesting. <laughs> Just having your tears away. Thanks, Glory Details. Yeah. Um, I love that they do that too, because there are so many questions you have in stop frame animation where you're like, how did they do that? And they, they're they like, we're not going to hide it. We're going to show you a couple of the more interesting moments, you know, monkey doing the, the roles. And they do the same thing with the missing link as well. So Show me the hard through. work that you put into this. Like, the, yeah. there's so much. Like, I think that's the coolest thing about like frame by frame or like the stop motion is that like every scene is deliberate. It's not like you're doing. I, I'm assuming reshoots. Like, you storyboard everything ahead of time, so it's just like so exact. Yeah. Everything that's going to happen, it's just such a cool way to film a movie or to create a film. Like, it that. is. Yeah. Animation in general is like it's overly worked before in the pre-production, right? When it comes down to planning, because it's so much more expensive to have to reshoot reanimate something than it is to have to reshoot something um so it's like m mega meticulous but it's worth it because that much planning means you're not really going to make a mistake and if you know if the story is good on paper generally it's going to translate well right and you don't have people improvising on set changing things and you, you're not like oh i have a new idea now because of somebody's improvisation on on set today and it changes everything so we have to reshoot a bunch of stuff now like no we recorded all the dialogue five years ago so it's done we're good we're doing it this way so we can get george <laughs> takai and that's it that's well i mean even if asian, imagine they had to do like asian inspired movie imagine we had to reshoot anything in this movie and they had to animate something at the end of the process and then they had to go back and get the kid who played kubo to redo his lines He's now four, 45 yeah exactly like four <laughs> years later his voice is like seven like, what's up deeper. guys oh, i'm yeah. kubo yeah. i'm kubo and the two strings yeah. And these are my two strings. <laughs> He's got a full guitar now. Like, I can't die in a place. Electric like guitar. This. Yeah. Well, um, that's the that's the movie. Uh, we do have a couple of things that we like to do around here before we actually get out of here. Um, we didn't have a theory corner this week, but I believe we do have a little bit of this action. If you had to pick one, well, what do you think the Home Alone of it is all? the Home Alone of it all? Can someone please tell me when the Home Alone? Of I really got it. When, is, when it is the Home Alone of it all? What is the Home Alone of it all? Now that's the Home Alone of it all. Simply so put, that, that one I picture a bunch of Muppets of me <laughs> with different voices. Yeah, going, that's ah. what I've always pictured. <sighs> Simply put, the Home Alone of it all is the part of the movie Home Alone where Kevin McAllister slaps down the blueprint on the table and he gets ready to sort of have Harry and Merv come in and attack the house um, and we watch them go through all the traps. The reason I came up with this theory is because like some movies, like you're, you want to go see the movie for that particular thing. Steve sort of evolved that idea by saying, you know, it could just be like the trailer moments, like the reason you watch the trailers, the reason you want to see the movie. And we've learned that sometimes it's just the third act. But uh, as far as the home alone of it all for this movie, Tatiana, do you want to do you want to hit us with yours? Because I know that you you were saying that you kind of I told you this early in the week. Normally, I don't reveal <laughs> my my secrets, but. What's your home? I had to it? ask because I wasn't sure. Um, okay, so I have two. One is a bit of a joke one, but for me, serious. Charlize Theron, which is right. hands down. <laughs> we'll watch yeah. any movie she's in. Um, and then the second, I think it's right at the beginning. I think it's the, oh, I think it's like literally the opening um, with Kubo being in the town doing his story. Um, and just, I feel like that scene was just so visually appealing and just so out of nowhere. I wasn't expecting it. I feel like that would immediately grab you. 
yeah, personally. I, yeah, I get mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. I I I can agree with that. My home alone of it all was uh, when basically the mom defends against the sisters, and the screen goes white. And Kubo is like on his adventure now. But I do have sort of a second one that's like once the once he like equips the two strings, you know, and is like the, now it's the Kubo end of the movie. The two strings. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Steve? Ah, oh, the curse of going last. <laughs> um I think that it's probably as soon as the sisters start whispering Kubo in the forest. I'm like, oh, God, here we go. Now, this is <laughs> now this is the home alone of it all. Because uh, up until this point, everything has been mysterious. You haven't seen anything. You've only heard about it from Kubo's mother and, you know, the warnings that we get. We see Kubo's magic. But we don't see any powerful magic. And then we all of a sudden see this extreme dark magic. And, you know, I already knew what these things were going to look like from the trailer, but I can imagine if you didn't know what they were going to look like, it would be quite shocking and you would be, you'd have that pit in your stomach being like, okay, these guys are clearly bad, (laughs) clearly evil sisters. And uh, yeah, it's when the movie starts to get exciting in a different way. The movie was already exciting from the moment you see her cut that wave in half with a musical note to him, uh, you know, creating an entire puppet show out of origami using his music. Uh, But this is when the movie gets spooky and exciting in a for a different completely different reason so that's my home alone of it all excellent well with that um we are of course going to play the uh the final game of the of the evening um are you guys ready to play a, a little uh, mpaa uh, game yeah i didn't ask what this one was <laughs> i didn't ask for this <laughs> it's time to play guess the mpaa Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the greatest game that ever existed on the internet or around the world. If you're going to blink, do it now. This is, of course, the MPAA rating game. What you have to do is, well, guess three numbers. The reason why is because every movie has a certificate rating, okay? The certificate rating implies that it's been rated by the MPAA. None of that is useful information to you. Forget it immediately. What you have to do is, I'm gonna give you two numbers. You have to give me the three numbers that come after that. You each get two guesses. Just to show you, Tatiana, I'm gonna have Steve go first. Steve, (gasps) the first two numbers, hold on. The first two numbers. (laughs) Doesn't matter. The first right. two numbers are four nine. Four nine six one six. Higher. Tatiana. Four nine 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 nine. <laughs> Lower. <laughs> How much lower? <laughs> Four nine eight one eight. Tatiana, higher. Four nine nine zero zero. Oh no! This is what happens when you lose. Oh, <laughs> Jason farts at you. I just tried. I just tried something from my butt. Sounded like here. a chainsaw. Yeah, it was bad. It was bad. It was bad. The number that's you know what people circled the drain on this. It's crazy. It's four nine nine one one. What? I was gonna guess that, and then I was didn't. Ja. When I said four nine nine. Was I, I, I you were like, she's really close. Like yeah. she could do this right now. Yeah. I think so I what wanna, was I guessing? Uh, the, Just a random it, number? No, it's the MPAA. There's five. It's a digit. Uh. It's mean, just like each, each movie that's rated gets a number. Rating. 
Got okay, it. It's, Jason that number, it. it's <laughs> that number that comes up at the bottom of the screen with like the globe and the, the little number. And every movie has had one since like the 1930s or something, whenever the MPAA was created. And it's just like when they get an R rating or an M yeah, rating. Or, so the, know, like that kind of thing. the certificate rating is that it's been rated. Yeah. It came from our, our old co-host, like just wanted to say the number and he eventually wanted to do the, the first movie or whatever. And when he left the show, I was like, I was still doing it. I was like, what if we gamified it? And now it's this nightmare fucking train wreck. Where we'll never, skip. ever, ever going to guess it. <laughs> it's Tim likes it, though. Tim, Tim <laughs> f- friend of the show, guest of the show, fan of the show, Tim likes it. So just there you go, it. Tim. <laughs> That's not the one I meant to play. The MPAA, everyone. The MPAA. And also, wow. that's funny to me. Um, wow. We've gotten to the end of the show. We're going to we're gonna get out of here real soon, so let's... It's time for our final thoughts. <laughs> and just like the beginning of the show, the end of the show is the same. Uh, our guest, of course, will go first, as I have declared tatiana please what are your final thoughts for this movie and if you have like a rating like a special rating that you'd like to give it whether it be serious or not so please enlighten us um my rating would be three strings out of two (laughs) and (laughs) my final thoughts would be um just watch the movie i i honestly did not know that this movie existed i'm so happy that i got to see it i think it's a beautifully done movie. I think it's beautiful in the story of like family and loss and love and all in this beautiful backdrop. Um, and I think I am now in love with like a studio. So I will be continuing the other two movies. Eventually three. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's actually, there is a third one out already box trolls, which we didn't, we only have four in a month. So maybe we'll do that one day. Awesome. <clears throat> Thank you, Tatiana, Tatiana Ramos. Not Ramos. Nailed it. Ramos. <laughs> All right, Steve, give us your final thoughts for the movie Kubo and the Two Strings. Kubo and the Two Strings. It's great. Um, I think out of the four Leica movies we did this month, it is one of the best in terms of uh, a perfect example of what you can do with stop frame animation. Um, like you were saying, it it, it can be confused for, you know, just regular computer generated animation. That's how good it is, but it's just so impressive. Um, but beyond that, the storytelling is very simple while also having an air of complexity to it, which I appreciate. Um, but it's not overly worked. It's not overly complex. You know, it, it can be compared to a video game at at times. It's like, you know, you're, you're collecting your quests for your item or sorry, your item for your quest your items for your quest there we go words go in specific order and then they make (laughs) sentences um and um yeah i I mean i I can keep talking positive positively about it but i think it is probably higher on the like a list than some of the other ones but not by much because i love all of these movies so gosh darn much uh kubo as a character he's feisty he's funny and he knows how to swing a sword and play guitar, which is really cool. Uh, If I had to give it a rating, I would give this rating a full set of glowing armor, but it glows on its own and it doesn't need the the light of the moon on it. It's free from the moon. No moon required for this stuff to glow. It's great. Kubo and the Two Strings. Thank you, Steve. Um, okay. One of the best tales of dealing with loss I've ever seen. I can't believe I never saw this. It has every element I love. Practical stop motion. That's sort of a new love, gotta say. That's sort of a this month new love. Uh, amazing storytelling, uh, Japanese folklore, and phenomenal music. The cast worked really well with McConaughey and Charlize Theron shining. Uh, the credit sequence was incredible with the Japanese version of My Guitar Gently Weeps um, and a bit of the stop motion pro- uh, process, which we we talked about. I don't think I can really find any other flaws other than it should have had uh, more Japanese actors involved. 
Uh, I messed it up several times with how powerful I, uh, with how powerful it felt uh, as a Japanese, as a fan of like Japanese media. Um, and I fully cried at the end. Well, my guitar gently weeps. Um, powerful movie. Everyone should see. I give this movie a five out of five. Whoa. Wow. The rare five out of five. <laughs> it's a super rare five out of five. <clears throat> I think the only other, like I, I give basketball, basketball a five out of five, but that's like a dumb nineties comedy. But I think the only other real five out of five I've given is like cast away. Um, um, I, yeah, this... I think that this movie resonates differently with different people as well. Right. So yeah. five out of five is fair. Yeah. I also give this movie remembering all those you've lost and holding them close, no matter what you've lost. A this, poetic rating. This was special. <laughs> this movie is special to me. Um, it's rare that I rewatch a movie like the next day. And uh... nope, don't want to get Jeez. don't want to get DMCA DCMA. Uh... <laughs> uh, Tatiana, thank you for coming on. You were an excellent guest. You're welcome back anytime. Thank you for having me. Do you have anything that you would like to plug? Um, <laughs> is this when I say, Hey, did you nope, see this one? <laughs> not yet. Do you have anything that you want to like promote or do you, or, or do you Oh like, no, do you, nothing on my end. Do you have a message for the world even? Oh, um, wow. Way to put me on the spot. I, well, <laughs> and make me feel like I have nothing to tell the world. <laughs> Don't go outside. You get sick if you go outside. It's true. It's terrible. <laughs> I agree. That's, That's a great message, especially That's in this, my message. this weird week where it's like winter now, I guess. Oh, uh, it's been crazy. In, in addition to that, I just want to remind everybody to please follow us on all social media. You can find us at Hey, Did You See This One on literally like every platform. I've backed off some of the like tertiary program uh, apps. Like I don't really do threads or X, Twitter or mastodon or hive anymore we do have a presence there but it's not worth it just follow us on instagram facebook and uh, uh twitch you can find us every week here on twitch on thursday at 8 p.m eastern time and with that and with that uh tatiana <laughs> I have a question that needs asking. <laughs> yes. um, w w there's a question we ask each and every week. Uh, could you help us out with that? Hey, did you see this one? I hope it's fucking playing this week. It's playing. Well, that was fun. I'm going to go watch this movie again and cry some more. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, I'm going to be honest. I don't really cry um, except for movies. I find it cathartic. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's nice to know I have another one in the wheelhouse. Yeah. Your, your cry closet? It's my cry closet. <laughs> You'd be surprised at what's in there. <laughs> yeah. You go in there and you're like, all right, if you got a blink, do it now. Sobbed. <laughs>